Welcome back to Soteriology 101, same song, second chorus. Let's pray technology works for us. <laughs> Eric is back with us, and uh, he he got his technology all worked out. Uh, Lord willing, if God actualized the world, that it will actually work today. Right, Eric? Welcome back to the program. Amen. Thank you for having me back. Well, we're going to dive right in, but first, let me just give a quick recap for those that are just tuning in. We had over like 3,000 downloads in 12 hours from the first 20-minute uh, episode, even with our technology dif technological difficulties. So uh, this is obviously an interesting topic to people. People are wanting to learn and understand. Uh, and, and just to give a quick recap, recap, don't worry, we're not going to go back over everything we talked about in the last uh, first episode, but just a, a recap to help understand where we're coming from when we're talking about a debate over Molinism versus Calvinism, um, and understanding that we are talking philosophical issues. That's one of the reasons Eric is here. I, I'm primarily a theologian, not a philosopher, and Eric is primarily a philosopher. In other words, he's been more trained in philosophy than I have, and therefore he is able to speak the lingo and understand uh, the jargon uh, better than I can. And and I think that that can help us to to better unpack these kinds of debates. Um, and, and what I pointed out last time is that there's a big difference between that and how John Lennox gets into this when he's asked about these issues, we can believe that something is true without knowing how it's true. For example, I know that God created something from nothing. I don't know how God creates something from nothing. I know that God knows the future free choices of creatures. Like he knows Peter will deny him three times before the rooster crows. I don't know how God knows the future free choices of creatures. I just believe that he does. What philosophers do is step into the how, and they begin to get into the metaphysics and to the understanding of how this might work, given God's knowledge, given God's omnis omniscience, omnipotence, his omnipresence, given all the attributes that we believe are true about God from what the scripture reveals, and all of the attributes about humans that the Bible reveals and our responsibility. And the philosophical, um, trained, well-trained philosophical people out there, theologians alike, step into the how and think, how could this work? Now, I think if those are being intellectually honest, they'll say, well, we don't know exactly how it works, but here are some theories. There are other people who dogmatically say, no, thus saith the Lord, God determines everything, as I think what we heard more from James White's side of the debate on the Unbelievable program. He pretty much dogmatically says, mine's not a theory. Mine's not a philosophical theory. Mine is from the Bible and from the Bible alone. And, and William Lane Craig, I think, intellectually, honestly says, no, these are theories. The Bible doesn't specifically tell us exactly how these things work. That's one of the reasons I tread lightly about taking on a philosophical ism with regard to Molinism, open theism, and all the other isms that could be created out there as far as how these things go, especially determinism when it comes to uh, the character of God and blaming God for something that he shouldn't be blamed for or giving God the, the, uh, the, the responsibility for something that I don't believe the Bible gives him responsibility for, I think we've got to tread lightly there and be very careful. And so I, I always remind theologians and Christians alike that you don't necessarily have to take a stance on this particular issue in the sense that the Bible, when silent, sometimes we should be silent. But at the same time, if a philosopher is going to step into the, the context of these kinds of questions, like I think William Lane Craig humbly does, and to say this is a theory, uh, it's a valuable theory, it helps us as finite creatures to understand how God might work with finite uh, people. And uh, an infinite God working in time and space with finite creatures is unfathomable. It is beyond all comprehension. Um, but at the same time, I don't think there's anything wrong with us talking through about how those things work, or how they could work, or how one might explain them. And of course, we always want to be consistent with the scriptures, and that's what we're striving to do. And so Eric uh, is here to help us with that as a fellow friend. Uh, he works with me at Texas Baptist, a lead apologist, and he is trained uh, in philosophy. He is a, he is a self-proclaimed Molinist. Uh, he and Dr. Craig have, have worked and talked together. I know William Lane Craig reviewed uh, on his program some of uh, Eric's own work. And so uh, Eric's uh, in the process of even writing uh, on uh, the topics of apologetics and uh, getting some things published in that area. And so I'm proud to work with Eric and appreciate his uh, his leadership at Texas Baptist and uh, appreciate what he's going to help us hopefully understand uh, in, these con in, the, in this conversation today. So without any further ado, let's jump right in where we uh, hopefully left off. We'll back up just a little bit um, because there was a lot of uh, kind of grumble, uh, jumbling, uh, and pausing in the uh, technology. And so we don't want to miss anything. So let's back up a little bit and uh, kind of pick up where we left off. All right, here we go, Eric. We ready? 
because yeah. at one level you know if you can have true human freedom a lot of people will say that that seems to be a better thing than than effectively god micromanaging if you like every but what all every action thought and will of the of the human person well there's a micromanaging on both sides um and obviously in looking at possible worlds feasible worlds uh god ends up micromanaging all the circumstances that people are placed in and that's why a lot of people um uh, reject molinism is it, it seems like a, a strange autonomy when you say that everyone's doing everything freely except they've been put in a position where that's what they would do and God okay let, let me hear from you on that one eric yeah so so to kind of um reiterate what i said yesterday um if, if he wants to use you know the language of micromanaging i don't mind that but uh, there needs to be a distinction made between micro planning versus micro causing and i want to give two examples of this um and what that would look like so uh when we look at things like miracles, or without getting into the technical definition of a miracle, um, you look at something like the Red Sea parting, and some people have posited that uh, God used natural means. In other words, there's a difference between divine intervention versus God using something, and it's kind of a hands-off approach, if you will. And some have posited that God could have uh, used like an earthquake or some type of mudslide or something to stop the Red Sea from splitting. Now, these have a sort of a natural explanation from our perspective, but the timing in which these things happen was God's... Uh, uh, What's God's sovereignty over everything that was going on? So in that sense, God was micro planning and uh, brought into fruition, actualized the world in which these things happen. And the timing is what's miraculous. Contrast that with God micro causing where God directly intervened and let's say split the Red Sea. Now, I'm not saying either one is a case. I don't know which one's a case, but I'm saying on one of you, God is micro causing. On the other, God is micro planning. And we would both agree God it's God's prerogative to choose whichever he wants. Um, now let's get into something like free will. Um, on a Molinistic view, God is not causing the person, or as was Craig was pointing out, moving the will of a person to do something. There's no deterministic uh, presuppositions in, in that, whereas on a, a um, causally determined uh, determinism view, something like Calvinism, you have God micro-causing, hence compatibilism. Right. So that would be the difference there. So micro-planning versus micro-causing. On Molinism, God uses the free actions and anything else to his, dispo uh, his disposure, and whereas on Calvinism, God is micro-causing everything. Well, uh let me let me entertain um, Idol Killer is in the side chat and um, he he's guy that kind of sides more of the dynamic omniscient some refer to uh, open theism those kinds of things which we have people on our program who side more in that area I don't throw people out of the kingdom based upon these philosophical differences by the way some people do and I don't I don't understand why you would do that but Idol Killer just says this he says ultimately the results from both Calvinism and Molinism are the same in other words eh just there's just two forms of Calvinism and that it's just determinism repackaged. And what do you say to those who hold to that view? Yeah. Well, if he's going to say the results are the same, um, I probably wouldn't push too much back on that because say, um, say a person dies from a heart attack and, uh, and it was natural causes and say I poison someone's coffee so that they're, they go into cardiac arrest and die. The results are the same, but obviously there's are two different scenarios. One was a natural cause and the other one was directly caused by me. Yes. And that, and that's, that's the, the key issue. It's one of the reasons I, I, I would be more friendly towards or more accepting of a Molinistic perspective than I would a deterministic perspective. Um, because the Molinist affirms libertarian free will, meaning the, the choice of the chooser is caused by himself, not by outside forces or, a, a sovereign decree, if you will. So uh, there are practical differences that are worth uh, noting uh, distinction wise. And so while yes, you're right, the, the result would be the same. Death comes, uh, the choice is made. Uh, so if you're talking about soteriology, the choice of Bill to become a Christian on both Molinism and Calvinism is the same. Bill becomes a Christian. The difference is that on Molinism, it was a libertarianly free choice as to whether he became a Christian, whereas on uh, determinism, it was God's decree that caused uh, Bill to become a Christian. Is that fair assessment, Eric? Yes, absolutely. Okay, great. All right, let's, let's move along. God knows they would do that. And many people would say, look, mankind is not nearly that simple. We don't exist as just this 
this thing floating in in uh, in, in ether that you know what it's going to do. We are made up of so many complex moving parts, and we sometimes surprise ourselves about what we do. Uh, I've surprised myself more than once by what I said or what I did in a situation. And so there's a lot of folks who would say, uh, how does God have this type of knowledge of what someone would do before he's decreed to make that person? Okay. How do you, how do you answer that one? Yeah. So, so this is very odd for him to say that um, because it, it, this, these kind of questions have always been bizarre to me. How can God, um, when it comes to the nature of God, there are certain essential attributes that he must possess that makes him God. An essential attribute is something that a thing must possess without which, without this thing, the, uh, uh, the thing would cease to exist. The number two could never cease to be even. So to ask how does a number two become even is, is the wrong question. It's, it's ontologically essential to the very nature of the thing that it is. Now, um, briefly, to simplify kind of the Molinist perspective, uh, it's, it's essentially a view of God's omniscience. And when we talk about propositions, we're talking about the content of a statement. Now, if God is omniscient, he knows the truth value of any given proposition. Now, there are various types of propositions. There are uh, tenseless propositions like Eric loves Taco Bell, and that is true or false. And if God's omniscient, he would know that. There are future tense propositions. Everybody uh, knows you like Taco Bell, not just God. <laughs> yeah, right. You yes. brag about Taco uh, Bell a lot. Uh, it, it, it is manna from heaven. Um, and then a future tense proposition would be that Eric will eat Taco Bell tomorrow. Again, God would know if that's true or false. And then you have counterfactual propositions. If Eric were presented with Taco Bell over steak, he would choose Taco Bell, which I have in the past. Um, and so if God knows these things and he knows these things from eternity past, and this is where you get into the Molinist view of God's omniscience, that God not only knows uh, tenseless, uh, uh, future, counterfactual, but he has all this prior to his divine decree. Um, so how can God know this? Well, because he's God. That's how God can know. He seems to think that because his objection implicitly was, well, how can God know these things about these creatures when he hasn't created them? Again, he's God. It's like asking, yeah. how does God have this power that he has? You know, how many how many sets does he do? How much time does he spend in the gym? Well, this is something inherent, essential to God. And to ask where it comes from is to misunderstand the very nature of God itself. Yeah, it's like Roddy's asking uh, in, in response to what White was saying. So it's, it seems as if White's saying, we don't even understand ourselves. So this is just, it's too, it'd be too complex for God to, to have th this kind of middle knowledge and these kinds of knowledges of all you know, future possible counterfactuals and these kinds of things. And I, and I think what uh, the, your point is, is that the reason God can know these kinds of things is because he's God. He, he has infinite abilities that we can't possibly even even comprehend, uh, which which makes these kinds of discussions difficult. I, I'm not going to pretend uh, like uh, I've got my brain around Molinism. I don't. Um I, I don't think it's, it, it, it is the more diamond shape. If you, if you hear Dr. White often talk about it, it's more orbed, multi-orbed and dynamic. And I, I can't think of a more multi-orbed dynamic perspective with regard to uh, God's omniscience and man's responsibility than that which is offered by Molinus. Um, uh, determinism seems to be the flat version of all of everything because it's basically God determines whatsoever comes to pass through primary and secondary causes. I mean, that's, it's very, very flat. Yeah. It seems to me it's a divine decree. God's pretty much scripted everything that's going to happen. That's the divine decree and everything's going to happen exactly as he's scripted it to happen. And that, that seems to be very flat. And I, one of the reasons I reject uh, Calvinism is the very reason that, that white talks about is that it is a flat version of the way God works, but let, let's jump into the yeah. next section here. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Well, yeah. And I was just gonna say, you know, no, it's not, we're, we're not saying mankind's that simple. We're saying God's that great. And and right, it's it's um because it, and we'll get into it later where it seems as if he he's almost implying that unless God causes something or creates something, he can't know anything about it. But I mean, that's just ridiculous on so many fronts. Even we can know things about things that don't exist yet. If uh, if if you know, before my son was born, um, he, uh, we already you know, my wife had already had a name in mind and things like that. So she we could say she knew what his name would be, even though he didn't exist, even before he was conceived. So, yeah, we, even we can know things about other things that don't exist. So surely God can. It reminds me of the interview I did with Dr. Ken Wilson, the Oxford, uh, the, the guy from Oxford that wrote his paper on Augustine and the whole debate with Manichaeanism and the Gnostics of the day and all that kind of stuff. And, uh, and he, he, he played that little clip of the puny God from, uh, the Avengers, you know, when, when the Hulk, you know, your puny God, you know, he's flipped. And he was making a joke that it seems, it seems as if 
when people say, well, that, that would just be too complex. I mean, uh, all of these free will choices to get to the cross, all these free will decisions to get to this event happening, uh, that, that's just too big. That's just too, that's it's just unfathomable. And uh, well, you know, if you have a higher view of God, then it doesn't, it, it, you don't have to figure out how God does that. It's it's that he does it that we have to, uh, that we have to affirm because the Bible says that he does it. And just because we don't know how doesn't mean that we need to insinuate that therefore he determines every lustful desire, thought, and action of humanity through some sovereign divine de decree. Um, and I, I, that's what we're, we're pushing back on. Yeah. If, and, if and if I can, if I can, if I can slightly correct myself there, uh, because I, I can already hear objections saying, well, you knew his name because you're the one that determined it. Sure. Uh, but in principle being that there are things that could be known about hypothetical situations and, um, again, if we can even have a tiny bit of that, then surely we can wrap our minds around the fact that God can know this about everything and anything, even things that don't exist. Right. Yeah. Well said. All right. Here we go. And so when we talk about the difference between a Calvinist and a Molinist, the assertion that is being made, and this is what came up in the, in the previous conversation, the assertion, and this is, this was the clarifying remark that Bill made right toward the end of the discussion. Here's the quote. What the Molinist does say that the Calvinist does find objectionable is that God is not in control of which subjunctive conditionals are true. He doesn't determine. Doesn't that just mean he doesn't determine what choices men will make? <laughs> I mean, am I, yeah, no. am I oversimplifying that? Because that's. That, no. that, that's the way I interpreted that statement. It just Yeah, to, to say that God's not in control of these subjunctive conditionals. So, so a, a subjunctive conditional would be, you know, what, uh, what a free creature would do in any given circumstance. So, right. So all, all he's saying, which it's, and he sounds like he thinks it's, he's making a profound point. All he's saying and, and agreeing with is that, um, well, on the Molinist view, is that God is not in control of what free creatures would do in a given situation. Right. That, that's a good thing because free creatures choose evil. And the fact that God is not in control of that is a good thing because then he's not, as Craig has later said, and I would agree, then God's not the author of their evil. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well said. Determine the truth value of these subjunctive conditionals. That's outside his control. So let me ask, let me ask Bill directly. Would you agree that these truth values of these subjunctive conditionals that is the essence of what middle knowledge is. Would, would you agree with that? No, I, I don't think I would, but I would say that's certainly an essential aspect of it. Um, the idea is that these counterfactual conditionals are true logically prior to the divine decree and are therefore independent of God's will. Uh, God does not determine what free creatures would do in any situation in which they find themselves. He takes hands off, so to speak, and says, okay. Okay, you wanna, you wanna comment on that? Because it, it almost seems as if White is like a almost gotcha because he's, or he does this kind of a thing, like, because Bill Craig says, um, you know, the, these things, these subject, these, these conditionals are not within the will of God. And of course, Calvinists are saying everything is in accordance with the will of God. Um, that's what determinism entails. And so he's he's saying these subjective conditionals, which for the layman just means the future free choices of men are not within the will of God. In, a, in other words, determined by God. Is that is that pretty accurate? Yeah, and, yeah and, not, and not just the future free choices, but the, the possible choices of what free creatures would do in a given situation. And the fact that God's not in control of these, again, to reiterate, it just means that God's not in control of what free creatures would do in a given situation. And yeah, and when when Craig, you know, says that, that, that is Molinism, White, you know, throws his hand up like he made some point. But again, that's a good thing because free creatures choose evil. If God's right. the one in control of that, and of course, it's going to depend on what the person means by control. If by control, as a Molinist would uh, uh, would would say is that God's in control of which world he creates knowing what these three creatures would do. So, you know, God could create, could have created a different world in which I chose a different path. Um, and, and of course that would be a different world because there would be other factors included, but that aside, right. It's a good thing that God doesn't control the, uh, these things, these counterfactuals. And for white to think that's a, that, that he has some kind of gotcha either misses the point of, of the Molinistic system, or I, I really don't know. I, 
I don't want to psychoanalyze. Well, and, and from the theological side of things, uh, again, I'm more the theologian than the philosopher. I immediately think of passages which support that philosophical concept, i.e., First John two sixteen, pride and lust are not from the Father, but from the world. Uh, in other words, what's the origin? This is what they get into the discussion of our authorship. You know, does God author evil? Well, that, that's talking about the origin of it. The author is the origin of something. The one who writes it into existence, who he comes up with it, right? Well, what, what it seems to me is that oh, Craig is saying God is not the one who comes up with, originates, authors, lust and pride. That is from the creation. But free will is not a superpower, as Dr. Pritchett likes to say. And that just because God chose to allow for creatures to have the ability of first cause choice doesn't mean that God loses his power and becomes less sovereign or becomes like this namby-pamby weak God that's just going, oh, eh, I guess I, I created creatures bigger than me now. I don't know what to do about it. Um, because that's what it seems like. I, I, mean, I, I know that sounds like I'm being, being overly pejorative towards my Calvinist friends, but I hear that online so much. It gets really frustrating. Like by just by giving men choices, uh, that somehow we be that we we believe God's just this weak namby pamby hand wringer that just doesn't know what to do now because He created these these creatures that are just going to overpower His will. Um, am I being unfair in that assessment? I mean, does it did, did, did it come across that way to you in this particular discussion? Well, well, I'm, I mean, to me it doesn't, but of course, you know, we can be accused of being biased. But no, it it, it, it and we'll get into this later with some other clips. But it, it's the fact that. Um, because, you know, where does this come from? He's going to ask later. Well, it comes from God's free choice. And who are we to question God if he wants to create free creatures and choose to limit himself, if you choose to use that word, to the uh, the counterfactuals of creaturely freedom? It's God's choice. So where does it come from? God's freedom, God's authority, God's sovereignty. Yeah, to bring it down on the bottom shelf for us, it's like the old illustration I remember a friend of mine using with Nolan Ryan, who was a you know pitcher in Texas history. Who, when he plays with his five-year-old boy, he's not going to throw the 90 mile, 90 mile an hour fastball. He's going to throw it underhanded to his five-year-old son. Doesn't mean he doesn't have the power to throw the 90, 90 to 100 mile an hour fastball. It means he chooses to throw it underhanded in order to, to, to be able to play with his son. If God chooses to incarnate, come down to our level, come in a manger instead of a mansion, wash the feet of people, lower himself, condescend, all of the things that we see in the incarnation, doesn't mean that he's less powerful. It, it, he's demonstrating what true power looks like. It looks like a servant, not a conquering dictator. Um, it's so not about God's so control. Saying, it's about his sacrifice. And so you're saying he limits his power. And and, and we're going to we'll get to that later. And we're jumping ahead a little bit. But uh, yeah, yeah, right. So God can choose to 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 limit what he does. But the question of can and what he does is different because, you know, Nolan Ryan can still pitch that 90 mile an hour, but he chooses to limit it. It's not that he can't, right. he just chose not to. Exactly. Yeah. And, and that makes sense. And, and then, and then somebody coming along and seeing him throw softball pitches to his son and saying something like, well, I guess he's weak and namby pamby. He can't pitch. And nah, nah, nah. that's what it feels like to us when Calvinists do that, because it's, it's almost like, it, it's almost like saying God cannot, be but omni everything with regard to his creation. He has to act in an omni everything kind of way towards his creation. He can't condescend. He can't. He can't uh, limit in any uh, way within the revelation. Otherwise, he just cease, ceases being God, and he gives men a superpower that can thwart God. And that that is just to us in our minds when we hear Calvinists make those kinds of things, we just go, "Oh my gosh!" And the eye roll just. That's what it feels like to us. It's just this feeling of exasperation, I guess, is is the best way to play, put that. But enough on that point. Let's move on. You make the decision. And I find the Calvinistic view less plausible, James, because it says that in any situation, it is God who actually moves the will of the creature to do evil um, and therefore makes God the author of evil Whereas on the Molinist view, as I say, what creatures would freely do in any situation is uh, logically prior to God's will, uh, and therefore it is, it is creatures that are responsible for natural evil, not God. Okay, before we move on, um, I, I heard his interview, Dr. White did an interview with Eli Aala, who is a good a friend of ours. We've had him on the program before, and I, I talk to Eli occasionally, and he's, he's a very good Calvinistic friend. Um, and, and very reasonable. 
um, and he he had James on his program, and they and they took issue with this. He didn't take much issue with it in the actual debate, but James said I, I purposefully didn't take issue with it because I was trying to focus on other things. Um, he didn't want to go on the defensive. Um, but what's so ironic about that? And tell me if I'm not being fair, Eric, in your estimation. Um, but it seems to me that that sometimes Calvinists will nitpick the verb that you use with regard to what God is doing uh, with regard to his causal decree. Um, and some Calvinists will say he brings it to pass. Some Calvinist says he sees to it that. Some Calvinist says he decrees it. Some Calvinists just come right out and say he causes it. Um, Calvinists use different verbs. Um, Craig is simply using the word he moves them to do this. Um, and he doesn't necessarily say how God moves them to do it because he's not getting into the metaphysics of the primary and secondary causation, but he's just, I think, summarizing in a, in a simple, easy to understand way what Calvinism entails is that God is somehow um, causally bringing about the pride and lust of men to do the things that they do when they act in pride and in lustful ways. Um, and so th this, th he, he, he really um, kind of jumps on William Lane Craig in that interview with Eli to say that's not what any Calvinist would say, and yet I read from Calvin himself talking about how God moves people. And then he even uses an illustration, ironically, later on about the king of Assyria and how God moves the king of Assyria to attack Israel. And you're, you're going, okay, you just now got on to Dr. Craig for saying he moves men to do evil, and then you actually use an illustration where God is supposedly moving men to do evil. And that, that sometimes I throw up my hands at that because that's when you get the whole accusation. Well, you just don't understand Calvinism. And no wonder we don't understand Calvinism. Your verbs change every so often. And when we try to use the very verbs that your own namesake uses, we're accused of not understanding Calvinism. Am I being fair in that assessment? I mean, what do you think? Uh, um, yeah, yeah. So I definitely think so in, in that. So what I like that what, what Craig was doing um, was that, so especially when you get into philosophical discussions, you have to be clear with the words you're using. And sometimes it's just best to avoid a word that could have multiple meanings and say something like move. Uh, those that have watched uh, either one of our channels are familiar with um, uh, the way I explain and define libertarian freedom and that you're the first mover. Um, you're not moved. And by move, we can say cause, causally determined by something external or prior to yourself. So when Craig says that God moves the will, he's saying, it, you know, it's in essence, you're saying that God's causing the will. Um, uh, at least that's what it would seem like. That's, a, that's what I interpret that as. And, and there's... A, because when we use the language, for example, I've, I've often talked with, with Calvinists and, you know, like you said, you have uh, friends who are Calvinists. Eli is a great friend of mine. You know, we talk uh, almost every week. Um, but, uh, um, in general, you know, sometimes Calvin would say, well, God determined this. Well, what do you mean by determined or God determined this word? What do you mean? Because I could say I determined to lose weight. Doesn't mean I'm causing myself to lose weight because I may, I may determine to do so, but then not follow through. So determined can mean to choose. And I have no problem with that. So it depends on what we mean by, by certain words. And we'll even see this really soon, how just uh, if subtle changes in the way you're expressing or saying something, especially in philosophy, is very important. So we, we have to be careful with what we're saying. And it's best to use words that clarify and get straight to the heart of the issue. And I think Craig, Craig did that beautifully. Well said. Okay. Well, uh, you, you did say, though, that these subjunctive conditionals are definitional to middle knowledge they are necessary to it yes um and yet they are outside of god's control yes so but they are also they'd all no wait, just a clarifying point there eric help me out here when when he says but they're outside of god's control and he just dr craig bill just immediately says yes okay um a lot of people hear that i'm trying to think from a layman perspective some people hear that and they go that's beyond god's control Oh, that means free will is a superpower. God, God can't control it. And that's what we were talking about earlier with the fastball analogy, is that the reason it's not within his, his control is because he chose not to control it, not because he couldn't if he wanted to. Please understand. Let that sink in, Calvinist. Anybody who's critiquing this, let that comment sink in, please. Dr. Craig, myself, and anybody else who on the Molinist side of things or even on the libertarian side of things in a more broad perspective, we are not saying that because God does not choose to control the free choices and actions of men, that therefore he could not if he wanted to. There's a big difference between that. And I think that white 
it seems like throughout this entire discourse, seems to think he's got Craig here because he got him to admit that that thing, whatever it is, that free choice of man is what he's talking about, subjective conditional, is outside of God's control. But remember, it's outside of God's control because God made it that way. Just, is that is that fair? Is that is that a good summary yeah. of that? Yeah, and on top of that too, because especially when you get into these, these um, weightier philosophical issues, uh, I'm not accusing White of doing this necessarily, but um, when you say things like that to someone who's not thought about these things or reflected or studied on these things, yet yeah, it sound there there could be a knee jerk reaction. But think about this: there there are a, a, f a good handful of things that are outside of God's control. It's not within God's control to make the number two odd. It's it's a logical impossibility. Um, it's not within God's control to make uh, a triangle with four points instead of three. Um, yes. But would we really really jump back and say, "Oh my gosh, it's, that's not within God's control"? And and what is and specifically to this discussion, what White is asking, what is it that is outside God's control here? The choices of free creatures, um, because it would be a logical contradiction to say that God is in control. In, and if by that you mean God is in control by causally determining the actions of free creatures, it's a logical contradiction to say that a free creature is causally determined by something else. So, yeah, that, that's just the way logic works. Free right. creature, the decisions of free creatures are not caused by God, and he allows that to be outside of his control, allows them to make choice. Well said. Kyle, it makes it uh, real succinct and it says it well. True power is having the power to do whatever you want. And also yeah. the ability to choose not to use that power whenever and however you desire. If you have no choice, you have no power. This is well, Kyle, well said. You should put that on a poster somewhere and, and put it right behind me. Um, because th this is exactly what we've been saying. He, he names his book, James White names his book, The Potter's Freedom, and then yet spends all his time arguing about how God is not free to limit his power. That That is just irony upon ironies, if I've ever heard it. And uh, something I think that we need to... Uh, um, confront. And that's what we're doing in love, uh, of course. Also do not arise from creatures because they have not been decreed to be created yet. Right? Right. So where do these truth values? Okay. Stop there. I know I'm stopping a lot and we've, we, I've got about 20 minutes of clips here to go through, but I'm trying to get my brain around all this too. And having you here helps. Um, help Use me understand. Mind. Yeah, yeah, you use my mind still. Okay. Of the brain. Right. So use my, my brain. Yeah, I know, I know that's your that's your he's big on the soul and the, the mind and using the proper language. I get I get called in the office on things like this all the time, guys. So <laughs> y'all bear with me. Um okay. Unpack that question for me. Because he asked the question, where does that come from? And he's talking about the subjective conditionals. He's all, he's talking about these free actions of creatures who don't exist yet. And so he's talking about the knowledge of what free creatures will do sometime later, prior to creation, I guess is what he's referring to. And and White asks him, so where do these, where does this come from? And and he and he even says it's not from the creatures because they don't even exist yet. And Craig says, correct. What's going on here? Are they talking past each other? Because I, I, I'm trying to understand from the Molinist perspective, what does Craig mean by saying, yes, you're correct. That's not coming from the creatures because they don't yeah, exist so, yet. So, so again, paying, paying very careful attention to how the things are worded, you know, is, is really helpful and important. And of course, you know, it, it's, it's not easy to do if you're not, if you're listening to these things for the first time. So note what White asks. He, he gives like a dichotomy and says, well, if it doesn't come, well, first, where does it come from? What is the it he's referring to? The it is God's knowledge, or at least that's what should be the topic of discussion here. Where does God's knowledge of this come from? Come from. He said, does it come from God? Well, no, because God does not determine the actions of free creatures. Well, and then he says, and here's where it gets, it, it can get confusing because of the way White worded the question. And he says, and it doesn't come from these creatures because God has not created them yet. And Craig says, yes. In other words, the dichotomy White is presenting is either... Does God cause these things to be true, like causing the actions of free creatures? No. Does it come from them existing? No. What? Uh, well, well, no. Why? Because they don't exist. But that very question, that second part, assumes that God would need to create these creatures in order for him to know what they would do or will do. But oh, if, no, but if he's following. omniscient necessarily, <laughs> well, then he doesn't have to create anything to know because he's inherently omniscient. Right. So I, I can know that if I create James White, that he will 
start a show called The Dividing Line, but that doesn't mean I have to create James White. Right. I can still choose not to create James White. Right. Okay. So, so the knowledge isn't dependent upon the existence of James White. Right. Nor is it dependent upon um, him, God, being the cause of what James White will do. Neither one of those have to be the case. So that's the false dilemma, at least as you see it from what James White's asking. And the reason Craig just says yes is because he's assuming that maybe White understands that. I, I, I'm not sure if that <laughs> yeah, would be the, the it's, case. Yeah, it's a bad question to ask because, uh, again, it's – and the reason, like you said, because it can get confusing to someone because a person may think – that what White was asking was, does this knowledge come from God knowing what these creatures would do? But that's not what White asked. White asked, does it come uh, implicitly? Basically, he's asking, what well, does it come from the fact that God has already created them? Well, no, because they don't exist. But again, so that's why Craig's conceding that. But it's, uh, it, if I can be honest here, it's just a poorly worded question that, like you said, I, I think Craig assumed White was using his words carefully when okay. the way he worded the question was just not relevant to the thing that Craig believes. It makes sense. Yeah. I, I, I totally couldn't get my brain around that until just now. It's like a light came on. I totally got, I, that, that's why you're here, Eric. Good, good job. Well, you, now your mind's you've, you've, good with it. So. Yeah, <laughs> my mind is good. I got my brain around it. Now my mind's good with it. Okay, good. Um, here's a question. That, thank you for the super chat. And this is a good question. I, I, I've heard people talk about this in the whole dynamic omniscience and uh, conversations. So God could control choices, but chooses not to. Does he also choose not to know in advance? In other words, if, if, if it were true, as some open theist argue that if God knows something in advance, then he must be the determiner of it. Because by the way, that's why William Lane Craig and others, and I've said it before too, that open theist and Calvinist are strange bedfellows because they both assume that God can't know the future free choices of creatures uh, unless he's determined it. So what the open theist does is remove uh, at least some aspect of God's knowledge of the choices. And what the determinist does, the Calvinist does, is say, well, the reason he knows it is because he causes it. He determines it. And so you've got strange bedfellows in the sense that they're both creating the modal fallacy of assuming that certainty equals necessity. Summary of that over, overall argument. Um, and what this this gentleman's asking, or uh, I don't know, a uh, guy or girl, I don't know, I'm not sure. Richard Settles. Atheist, atheist, atheist. Yeah. Guy. It's, it's Richard? Okay, I didn't know who it was. Richard okay, Settles, Richard. Yeah. Awesome so guy. Richard's... Yeah, Richard's asking this question, and um, and so he's saying, is it possible for God to somehow limit his knowledge so as not to be the cause of future free choices? In other words, if that's what's required of God to create free moral creatures, why not just say he limits his knowledge of those choices? How would you answer that? Yeah, so so it's a really good question. Um, a few things. Uh, so does—, does so does he choose to not know in advance? Well, um, I, I don't think he chooses to not know in advance. Uh, can he? Sure, he could. And here's why I say it's an interesting question. When you look at the incarnation, uh, remember earlier I said there are essential attributes that God must possess in order to be who he is, that he cannot lose. Um, and I would say one of those is omniscience. But then when you look at something like the incarnation, you have God in the flesh. So the question is, was Jesus omniscient? Did he know all things? Well, yes, but the other question is, is God powerful enough to choose to limit the access that he has to all that he knows, his omniscience, while incarnate? And the answer to that would also be yes. So uh, does God now, does uh, setting aside the incarnation, does God choose to, to not to know in advance? I don't, I don't think so. I think he, he from, from the beginning, given Molinism, he's chosen to to, to – uh, look, look, look at everything, so to speak, before anyone jumps on me using that word. Um, he knows it all. Um, but I think in the incarnation, I think that is something like what Christ did, where he uh, was powerful enough to limit what he was able to use within his attributes. And and, right. you know, to, to help wrap our minds around this, you can think of someone going into or outer brains, space. One. Yeah. <laughs> uh, when someone goes into outer space, they put on a spacesuit and by doing so, they have limited the uh, um, the ability to use the capacities they have. In other words, when an astronaut goes into outer space, he can't reach down and touch the moon with his bare hands and, and fingerprints because he's put on a spacesuit. So he's limited. In other words, he didn't lose it. He's just chosen to put something on that's limited his access to what he has already within himself. So um, right. again, no, I don't think God chooses to not know in advance, but I think with the incarnation, something like that is certainly happening. Great. Well said. Uh, values come from if they do not come from God and do not come from God's creatures, because 
you s- okay so again i know we're pausing a lot but but notice the point he's continuing to make if, if it's not from god and it's not from the creatures then where does it come from what's the origin of, from the of, from the of, creatures being created already is what he's asking specifically right Right, because it, it so, does. The knowledge does come from what the creatures would do, but what he's asking specifically is, does it come from them existing? And the answer is no. It doesn't come from them existing. It comes from God knowing what they would do even before they existed, like you mentioned right. earlier. Okay, good, good. Say that God's decree is delimited by and um, takes into account was the terminology you used just a few moments ago on this program, delimited by and takes into account middle knowledge. So we have something that has truth value that delimits and determines the range of God's decree, what's feasible for him and what's not, but it doesn't come about from God's creative action. So where does it come from? This is an objection to middle knowledge that's known as the grounding objection. It claims there needs to be some sort of ground of the truth of these counterfactuals of creaturely freedom. And here I frankly agree with Alvin Plantinga that it's much clearer to me that at least some counterfactuals of creaturely freedom are true than that they must be grounded in this way. Okay, so explain that one for us. Um, Unpack that for the layman. Grounding principle, grounding objection. What are they talking about? Yeah, so it's, it's, it's... It, it can kind of be summed up in what we've been talking about already. Uh, and without getting too technical, uh, Craig does address this later, that basically that there has to, and especially from what, I'll explain it the way it seems that James White's asking it, that there has to be something already out there existing to make something true. Um, and as Craig Which explained- Which is exactly just, what the open theist is arguing, right? Something has to, you can't know something that isn't existing. It, 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 the truth hasn't happened yet. So you can't know something. He knows all truth that's happened. He knows all truth that that exists. But if a person hasn't made a choice yet, then that truth doesn't exist. So God can't know it is, is sometimes what I hear open theist arguing. And in the same way, it seems as white is conceding. That's true. God can't possibly know something that doesn't exist like a free will choice of a creature. Is that is that accurate? Yeah, yeah, that's a fair summation. You know, some may, may word it differently, but yeah, overall, um, because uh, an open theist may say it's it's not logically possible for God to know it's a future tense the truth of future tense propositions because there's nothing there to make it true or false in the first place. So yeah, and that's where the grounding and that's the same as the grounding objection. That's basically yeah. There, the there are variations concept. of the grounding objection, but yeah. Okay. All right. Moving on. So when I look at uh, the examples that are given and I look at any human being, I know that human being, the, the decisions that I make, I make because God has given me certain gifts and withheld others. It has never been a part of my decision-making to, to be a center in the NBA because God right. did not gift me with the things that are requisite for being a center in the NBA. But the gifts that have been given to me are part of his decree. They are, they, they are a part of his, the expression of his freedom in his creation. And so there are all sorts of those things that go into what any human being is. Not, and I, I'm not even talking about the fallen nature, depravity, um, mm-hmm. the, the, the people around us. That there's just so many of these things that would determine the things that we would do. But as Christians... No. Okay. I, I want to pause it right there for for two reasons. One, and we'll we'll get to this later because he he brings this up at least two more times. Um, first on, on on the nature of man side, he says there there are all kinds of things that go into what a human being is. But what he's talking about is he seems to assume that what makes you what you are necessarily, because when you're talking about essence, you're talking about things that are necessary to a thing's nature, and, and he's saying all kinds of things go into what a person is. Um, talks about being in the NBA, whatever, and gifts. But the thing is, I could still be the same person, even if I had a different set of what's... So in philosophy, there's accidental properties and essential or necessary properties. The accidental are contingent properties. You know, I you know, I can dye my hair pink, but I'm still Eric. So that doesn't go into my essence. That goes into just accidental properties that I have. I can lose and change these out and still be me. Um, so we'll set that aside for now because it'll come up later. And then the reason I, w- I wanted to stop there is because if you notice, White says that there are so many things that would determine the things that we would do. Note the words he uses, and then 
we'll we'll come back to it when you hear the way Craig rewords what White said to fit what Craig believes. All right. When we talk about plausibility, the, the real question for us should be, would the apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ, would the prophets, when they were speaking in Isaiah concerning the nature of God, we have something more than just simply philosophical plausibility arguments. We have the light of Scripture. Yes, and so of course. And so if there is going to be the assertion, as middle knowledge makes the assertion, that there are these true subjunctive conditionals that are the basis upon which God's decree is acted out, I think it is quite, it is quite necessary for us as Christian theologians to say, from whence comes that which limits what God can do and how he can do it. But let me address yeah. Before well, before he addresses that, when he asks that, he uses that from whence comes several times throughout the discussion. Um, unpack that a little bit from your perspective. What is what is White asking, and how is Craig answering that question? Yeah, so, and this is the thing that, it, so, as a side note, it, it really went off the rails from Problem of Evil specifically, and it went into uh, this grounded objection and, and this where does this come from kind of thing? And again, what is the it? What's the origin? Well, God's, yeah. God's knowledge. Yeah, the, the it is God's knowledge of what free creatures would do. And, and as I said earlier, where does this come from? From God's free choice to create free creatures. God can choose to create a world in which he allows free creatures to make decisions, and he limits himself to what they would do. But again, where does it come from? God's authority, God's sovereignty, and God's free will. Um, so, so yeah, it's, it's to, to keep asking this question, it, at this point we'd be reiterating ourselves, just like a father can choose to limit how much power he uses. God can choose to limit what, what amount of causal determinative control he has over the world in which he creates. Yeah. Well, well, well put. Just a couple of other points James made. Mm -hmm. First of all, his point that people don't exist in a sort of vacuum, but have a whole history of their character and background and characteristics um, that shape what they freely decide. And of course, I agree with that. And the point okay. is that these counterfactuals of creaturely free. So here, okay. here's where that, that subtle thing I pointed out earlier comes into play. So earlier, White said there are a number of things that would determine what we would do. And given he's a Calvinist, he means causally determined. And know what Craig just says. Yes, there are a number of things that shape what a free creature decides. There's a difference in language that is so subtle, but it's, it's, it's profoundly deep. Because if all these things determine what I do, then I'm not free. I'm not the first mover. I move by those things. But if all these things merely shape the decisions, which is what Craig used to word it, then as, as, as we've often said, influences are not causes. So when White's talking about all these things and the gifts that God has given him, he's talking about things that will influence his decision, but influences are not causally determinative. If he wants to say that these are causal determinations, then he'd have to give some, he'd have to bear the burden of proof to, to show that these things quite literally determined, these desires determined my actions, but desires are not causal, they're influential. I can have influences, but it is still up to me as a first mover to choose to act or refrain from acting upon my influences. Yeah, we've talked about that quite regularly is, is sometimes desires are treated as if they're causal um, motivations. You can have competing motivations, but as a free creature, you choose as to which motive you're going to act upon. Um, and that's thus you're held responsible. That's what separates us from the animals. We're not instinctive beings just acting upon this greatest preset desire, i.e. instinct, that God has created us to have in the given stimuli that he is also determined. That, that just makes us into uh, animals or more robotic in a sense, rather than understanding that we as moral beings have the ability to act upon this desire or this desire or this desire or this desire, many competing desires. And oftentimes our character, which we do have, some control over in developing who we are at any particular age in life based upon our previous choices. Our character will help us in the making of those decisions and acting upon those competing motivations and desires, which seems to be much more reasonable and something that most of us, I think, deal with on a regular basis as theologians uh, or lusters, either one. Factor that in. Uh, the counterfactuals of creaturely freedom that God considers are usually thought to 
to include the whole history of the world up to the time of the decision. And then God uh, asked what would the creature do freely in that situation. So of course it reflects the creature's background, abilities, uh, proclivities, and so forth. But the, the key point that divides us is that God doesn't determine how the creature would act in those situations. He lets him decide. And this is so important with respect to evil decisions, that God doesn't move creatures to do evil and then punishing them, punishes them for what he makes them do. Now, of course, our view has to be biblical. Uh, in my work on this, I always start with the Bible. And what I would argue is that Molinism, while not taught in the scripture, is consistent with the scripture. And this is part and parcel of reformed theology. Uh, for example, we would affirm things like the necessity of God's existence. Most reformed theologians would affirm God's timelessness and spacelessness. None of those things is taught in scripture, but they are all consistent with scripture. And so the idea of of, of worldviews or, or positions that are consistent with Scripture, though not explicitly taught by Scripture, is familiar in, in Reformed theology. And I think that Molinism makes the best sense of the scriptural data concerning divine sovereignty, which says that everything falls under God's decree, and its affirmation of human freedom and responsibility. And it's only by denying the latter uh, that the Calvinist um, is able to treat the problem of moral evil by saying God is the one who determines how anyone would act in any situation God might place him in. Okay, so th this is one of the points that I was pointing out early is the, the whole approach of White is more of a dogmatic thing saying uh, not only do we know that uh, – sovereignty is true, i.e. determinism is true, and men are responsible. We know that it's true because the Bible just clearly says so, and we're Bible followers. You guys are just doing this philosophy thing. Is That that seems to be the kind of argument that White was making, whereas um, uh, Craig is taking more, I think, of an on, intellectually honest approach in the sense that he's humbly saying, this is a theory. We, the Bible doesn't specifically tell us exactly the metaphysics of how all this works. Um, this is one theory. And therefore, you don't have to be a Molinist to be a Christian. Um, and that's one of the things I appreciate about Craig so much is that he's not trying to go out there and uh, evangelize people to be a Molinist. And he's not trying to say that everybody has to be a Molinist to be a Christian by any means. And he's certainly not saying that you can open up to, you know, a Bible passage and, and read about God actualizing certain worlds, this kind of thing. He, he is honestly saying this is one theory of how it might work to understand divine omniscience and human responsibility. Um, and, and when somebody steps in and dogmatically says, thus saith the Lord, i.e. determinism must be true, um, that, that's where I think there's real danger when spe people speak with that kind of dogmatism of thus saith the Lord when the, the Bible simply never says what the determinist insinuates. And you see a lot of uh, hand-waving here with regard to Ephesians 1.11 which is really just a parallel passage of Romans 8, 28, that God works all things together for good, those who love him. God works all things for those who are in Christ, is exactly what he says there in Ephesians. And, and, and Calvinists, at least like White, seem to dogmatically say, well, my interpretation, begging the question, my interpretation, i.e. the deterministic interpretation must be the right one. Therefore, we're getting our philosophy from the scripture and you're not, which is just a big game of question begging. Uh, do you want to comment on that? Um, just just simply say, yeah, it, it, and and because he brings it up later, so I'll I'll reserve my comments for there. But yeah, it's there, there's what I see White doing at least in this debate because I haven't seen too much of of um, I've seen enough of his other talks on Molinism to where uh, uh, to say I I don't want to watch much more of it. Um, but um, I'll say that he 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 seems to quote a verse and then give his. And then just restate his position as if quoting a verse and then saying what you believe is somehow exegetical commentary on a verse. Um, yeah, so so and, and you're right. What Craig is doing, and he brings up 
White brings up plausibility. So I'll set that aside because he brings it up again later. But yes, what Craig is doing is, is just saying that here's something that's consistent with the data because there are some instances where Scripture is underdeterminative about some things. For example, if we look at God's omniscience, uh, excuse me, om omnipresence, um, the Bible doesn't give us a, a philosophical, metaphysical definition of that. What does it mean for God to be omnipresent? Well, he's everywhere. But what does it mean to be everywhere? Is this like uh, butter on bread where it's kind of spread out evenly? Um, my my living room is bigger than my bathroom. So does that mean there's more of God's presence in my living room than in my bathroom because it's a bigger space? Um, I, I heard one guy, you know, say that, um, you know, he, he – uh, you know, the bigger I get, the more room there is for the Holy Spirit. Of course, he was joking. But what kind of what kind of how do we hash that out? You won't find a passage in verse citation to give you that definition that takes philosophical reflection of the data of what Scripture gives us. And that is what Craig is doing. Amen. Well said. The, the real issue is when God decrees is what flows from his decree freely coming from his will or is it delimited by something we don't know where it comes from it doesn't come from god it doesn't come from his creation and that is these this counterfactual knowledge that we are not we're, we're being told well that's just a, a truth maker theory of knowledge i would say from a biblical perspective if we're going to say that the great yahweh is limited in what he can do what is feasible for him to do then we need to know from whence comes this strange delimitating uh, authority. I don't think that Before, has anything to do with it, philosophy. It has to do with it, a claim is being made, so we need to know where that's coming from. Yeah. Okay, but I, I would like to ask real quick before you answer that one. From whence comes the power or the authority that makes God have to use his all controlling power and authority every time he deals with humanity. In other words, it, we could turn that right around back onto the Calvinist and say, from whence comes this belief that God has to micromanage molecules in order for him to be sovereign? W from whence comes the, the limitating uh, incapacity of God to do anything but throw 90 miles an hour fastballs when he's dealing with his creation? From whence comes that authority? I, I mean, we can turn that right back around on them. At least what we're saying is that God has the freedom to use his power as he chooses with regard to his creation. Okay, what say you, Eric? Yeah, so so he's doing it again. Um, and uh, if you if you pay attention to the way he's wording it, 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 it's it's poor wording because it's not getting to what he thinks it's getting to, or he's just assuming this grounding objection, uh, maybe a little bit of both, because he says if it doesn't come from God. Now, and, and to even clarify, remember I said earlier, what is the it? It's God's knowledge of these counterfactuals, and he just said that. He said, you know, when he's talking about the it, and he says what we're talking about is God's knowledge of these counterfactuals. He says, if it doesn't come from God, so let's translate that. The choices of free creatures of what they would do in any given circumstance does not come from God because God does not causally determine free choices. That's a lot of contradiction. So if first it doesn't John come from God, yeah. yeah, if it doesn't come from God, right? So it's not the first option. And it doesn't come from, note, his creation. Well, no, why? Because these people don't exist. Uh, uh, prior to the divine decree, these people don't exist. So no, it doesn't come from God causing it because they're free, and it doesn't come from his creation because nothing's been created yet. So where does it come from? Well, well first of all, those aren't. it's a false dichotomy. Those aren't the only options. And as we've said repeatedly, uh, he's omniscient. He, he, he's, that, he's that big. He's that powerful. He's that smart. He, it, it comes from him knowing the truth value of all propositions. So for him to repeat the question... And, and and to word the the dichotomy in that way from God or His creation, what's well, neither of those two? Because and, and to ask a question again, Mrs. Molinism. Well, this where, this is where the word learning comes in, is to where you'll often hear the objection. Well, God doesn't learn things, and and I think the Molinist, it seems to me, would agree with that. God doesn't learn in the same way that you and I would learn. So I I learned that you wore a gray shirt this morning because I saw it for the first time. Uh, when you came onto the camera. So I learned that piece of information. And I think the Molinists would agree that God doesn't learn in that way. But the reason God knows it is not because he sees it or he learns it. It's because he's God. And that is what's beyond full comprehension is how does God have this capacity to know things? Um, just like how he has, how does he have the capacity to exist in all eternity or to create something from nothing? We, the, this is the that versus the how. Nobody knows how he knows 
all things. We just believe that it's true because it's a, a characteristic as described in scripture of who he is. Is that fair? Yeah. Yeah, and and he and the other uh, implicit dichotomy he seems to ask is he says, well, if it doesn't come from God's free decree or decision, uh, uh, then then he, he talks about the limitations. He's like, so so what what is it? You know, in other words, it's as if God being free and limited is mutually exclusive. Right? Could it not be the case that God freely chose to limit Himself in the way we've been talking about from the beginning by creating a world in which there's free creatures? Yeah. So it's even a false dichotomy on that front to say it's either God's free choice or he's limited by something external to himself. Well, why can it be that God in his own free decision chose to limit himself? So yeah, yeah. It, it, they're, they're bad questions that miss the point of Molinism. Yeah. It's the, the whole point. The, the potter has freedom, <laughs> ironically enough. Right. So in scripture, we are given numerous examples where God explicitly says, Genesis 50, 20, it's been discussed on your program many, many times by all sorts of different people, but the text says what the text says. Joseph, knowing that his brothers have committed evil against him, knowing that what they did was wrong, knowing even that God had actually restrained their evil. I, I don't know why God didn't just put him in a situation where they would do freely, but God actually restrains men's evil. God actually hardens men's hearts in other situations. Why would he need to do any of this if he has just put them in situations where they act freely? And why would he need to do any of this if he's just determined everything they think and desire and plan? I mean, that that this whole concept, I've asked this, I asked this in the debate, and I never got an answer, at least a cognizant answer that I understood, is that what is there to restrain and or permit if you don't presuppose libertarian free will? In other words, you either have God restraining his own decree. In other words, I decreed for this person to want to murder, and then I restrained them from murdering. So therefore, I am restraining what I decreed for them to do. It's like I heard White even argue that if if God uh, destroys a baby in the womb, or allows for, permits, or decrees for a baby to be destroyed in the womb, how do you know he's not preventing another Hitler? Well, the only reason he would be another Hitler is if God decreed for him to be another Hitler. So just don't decree him to be another Hitler, and you, then you don't have to destroy him in the womb to keep him from being the Hitler. That doesn't make any rational sense to me. So this whole vocabulary of God restraining and or permitting seems to me to presuppose libertarian free choice. What do you think, Eric? Am I, am I overstating my case there? Am I not seeing something with regard well, to the philosophical side of how God would restrain or permit evil? Yeah, no, so, so, and even more to the point, you know, it's not just that God decreed it, because of course we would all agree that God has decreed things. Um, and of course, that you can get into differences there. But, but again, we have to be precise with our language. And for him to say just decree, well, what do you mean by that? And, and if by decree, you know, one means that God chose to create this world. Okay, that, that, but that says nothing to whether or not these creatures were free. If by decree you mean right. God causally determined, or like Craig said, move the will of these men to these things, and that's a whole different ballgame like you just explained. Um, also, he, he says here that God actually restrains men's evil, what we just heard. God actually hardens men's heart in other situations. Why would he need to do any of this if he has just put them in situations where they would act freely? Well, that's exactly what Scripture tells us God did. Well, let me, let me, let me not overstate. Scripture does seem to imply this is exactly what happened, and uh, what's even odd too here it that just crossed my mind is that for if God had to if God is hardening these men's heart, then why did He need to do why not just place them in this situation and not harden their heart? It seems as if White thinks that it, unless God does it, um, then then it it's going to be something that God that God wouldn't have to change anything around if he does it. But I, I think that kind of marks against his position because it also, it's going to depend on, on how that metaphysically hardening of the heart happens because there's different ways in which I can harden someone's heart. I can harden your heart right now. You can harden my heart. I can, someone can walk up to me in the street and, you know, just say nasty things about me and my family or my kids and my wife. It'll, it'll harden my heart towards that person. But did they causally determine that? No. Again, influences are not causes. So, could it not be the case that by placing these men in certain situations, he did things like harden their heart or or any other passage that he brings up? So it's another false dichotomy that either God causes it, um, uh, because that's essentially what I'm saying is I think he means by when he thinks 
when, when in his mind, when you're talking about hardening hearts, he may think of some kind of, as Craig said, he moves the will. He causes this. Right, whereas right. he fails to maybe, I don't know if it's crossed his mind that, or maybe God could have hardened the heart by placing this free creature in this situation. And that influence would have led to the uh, hardening of his heart because of these this free creature's free decisions and everything else that 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 has developed his character, which also were based on the creature's free decisions to begin with. Yeah. And in White and I have gone around and around about if, uh, Genesis 50 on other programs. And one of the things I notice about White's inconsistency in dealing with that passage is that he'll continue to talk about how they are judged justly because of their motivations, ignoring the fact that their motivations are likewise decreed by God. Uh, and when you push White on that, that's when it goes silent, crickets. Um, and, and this is this is what I read from the, the best of the best philosophers who are confronting compatibilistic determinism is that to say that we're doing we're free as long as we're doing what we want ignores the reason we want what we want is in accordance with what God has decreed for us to want uh, in any given circumstance. And so uh, whenever he appeals to Joseph's brothers and says God intended it uh, for good, man intended it for evil. Well, the intentions, the murderous intentions of the brothers or the the jealous intentions of the brothers, the prideful intentions of the brothers are not from God, according to scripture. They're not from God. And yet Calvinists, at least true theistic determinists, is, is, as I understand them, are saying it is from God. Everything is from the divine decree on theistic determinism. And that's what I think uh, Craig is pushing back against. It's certainly what provisionists as a whole are pushing back against is that God doesn't decree, determine, even tempt men to do evil, much less causally determine it. Uh, and so for God to intend for a certain thing to happen does not mean he has to causally determine for evil creatures to do evil. He can know and use evil creatures in their already evil ways to bring about his good purposes without being the one who causally determines evil to take place. But in the situation of what the brothers did to Joseph, God specifically says through scripture, you meant this for evil. He does not excuse their sin. He does not say, oh, you're just puppets on a string, so it doesn't really matter. He knew what filled their hearts. He knew that God had restrained them from killing him. And yet, in the very same sentence... He knew what filled their hearts, or he determined what filled their hearts. He knew what filled their hearts, or he decreed what would fill their hearts. That's a See, great this, way of putting it. Exactly. It's, you've it's got the to, language. You've got to point out these things. This, this, he, he continually uses provisionistic language, free will language, as if it's consistent with his within his deterministic worldview. And if you're not listening for it, you won't catch it. And I, a lot of people don't even know to listen for it. He says, God intended it for good and to save many alive to this day. Acts chapter four of where God's sovereign decree. You want to jump on that? You want to talk? Well, well, what I was going to say is, is and, and I think this is it, is what he says, he's, if if you were to if I had no idea who James White was and you were to play the this clip and then what he's about to say and show it to me, I would think he's a Molinist. And Craig's about to point this out as well. He sounds just like a Molinist because of the language he's using, the way he's wording it. Um, yeah, I would have thought he was a Molinist if I hadn't known him. Hmm. He limits man's evil and accomplishes God's purpose through that evil, and that God then. God accomplishes his purpose through that evil? That sounds like me. I wrote that in my book. In fact, God doesn't cause the evil intentions of the brothers. He doesn't decree the evil intentions of the brothers. He knows and uses. The word uses is our language, not the Calvinist language. God doesn't just use anything. He decrees it. The reason that he can use a tool is because he's created the tool to be what it is on Calvinism. We just say he uses tools uh, for his own good purpose, because the tool is responsible for what they end up choosing to do, because they're responsible for what motivations they act upon. They're not acting in accordance with the div divine decree. They're acting in accordance with their own free decision, their own responsibility within that given circumstance. It is men, not for their knowledge of a divine decree, but for acting upon the desires of their hearts. That's the basis. Of See, there he goes. See, he says he, he judged them for acting upon the desires of their hearts without addressing why they desire that in their hearts. He ignores that issue. Every time I've brought it up in the debates, every time back and forth on Twitter, every time in our back and forth, you know, I bring this up over and over and over again with White. Crickets every single time. Prove me wrong. Anybody in the side chat, I think Pinko whether there was over there, he's she's she's one of the best advocates for White. Find it for me, please. Where White has ever answered that issue.
because it doesn't exist as far as I'm aware. And I've got a lot of people listening to White on a regular basis looking for it. So um, yeah. if, if you if you can find it, let me know. Eric, what do you think? Yeah, and, and to pull back the onion layers a little bit more too, philosophically speaking, is – and if, if the person, again, if the person isn't familiar with these issues or the Calvinistic deterministic uh, position, um, I would argue, uh, not a main point, but I would argue that Calvinism is wed to determinism or compatibilism. Um, and compatibilism is just a soft determinism. And on compatibilism, a person's greatest desire causally determines their actions necessarily. Now, like you just pointed out, um, where did they? Where did these desires come from? Well, if we even rewind further, uh, it seems like White is saying that everything that is about me, he, he calls them gifts because he's talking in a positive light. Um, everything that I have are these gifts God given me, and this makes me who I am. Well, if we can translate that to say everything I'm born with was things that God gave me, and these things and desires God gave me is what caused me to be the person I am. Well, let's look at someone who claims to be born gay or homosexual or transgender. Did God? Give that to them, according to White. Yes, that's he wanted to call it a gift. Uh, and 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 if I'm wrong, you know, I, I'd like to know why. Because based on what he said, if God gave this to the person, and these desire, these are what bring about the desires of the person. And if on compatibilism, these desires cause you to determine their actions, then you're not going further back enough. If you say, well, God's judging them for acting on the desires of their heart. Well, we need to step back further and say, and where do these desires come from? And if we write, rewind what White was saying, everything that we have come from God, and those are what gives our desires. So, hence, God is the author of evil, as Craig points out. Well, you, if you say all things means all things with regard to the sovereign decree, that God sovereignly and unchangeably decrees all things, that would include same-sex attraction. Um, that's, uh, that's a thing that's uh, the desires of the heart of men are included within all things. And so, unless Calvinists are making the caveat God decrees whatsoever comes to pass with the exception of the pride and lustful, sinful thoughts of men and you know creation, then they need to make that caveat really clear because as far as I know, they don't make that caveat. As far as I've, I've heard from Piper and others when asked that question, directly asked that question, in fact, they will, in the affirmative, say, yes, even God decrees your besetting sins and your desires and your choices. Uh, that's consistent across the board among leading Calvinists that I'm aware of. Um, and so when people... Uh, indicate otherwise, it seems to me they don't understand the namesake of their systematic or the leading scholars who are promoting uh, their systematic. Of what the judgment is made upon. So we've th this has been discussed, and, and if you want to get real philosophical about it, by Jonathan Edwards and others for quite some time. But I just point out that in dealing with our subject, Molinism, we're dealing with a perspective unknown in the history of the church for 1,500 years. It's what you intended for evil. Okay, so th this is kind of genetic fallacy. This has been unknown, or you know, until Molina, uh, Molina came along. Uh, there's actually some argue that there was some early church writings earlier than Molina that get into this. Um, some people have made that that case as well. I heard that at the EPS, in fact, that there was some uh, uh, Gregory uh, uh, Nantiensis, I believe it was, or something of that nature said something. Anyway, there, there's there's theories out there of other people talking uh, on this, this same kind of issue. But nevertheless, um, who cares if you're comparing whether it came 500 years later, like with Augustine, or 1500 years, either case, it's not inspired text. It's it's a philo it, Because White is treating this like a philosophical theory, not inspired text, that's not a problem for, for Craig because he's not treating this as if it's inspired and necessary for salvation. Um, if, if it was inspired and necessary for salvation, then it would be really, really troublesome that it didn't show up for 1,500 years. But the fact that this is a philosophical theory to answer an inscrutable matter that the Bible doesn't necessarily specifically address, then when it happened, whether it's 500 or 1,500 years after the, the time of Christ, um, makes no difference as to the, the legitimacy of the argument. Am I being fair in that? Yeah, and, and here's an, when you said that a, a few things that crossed my mind. Um, one, if uh, because in other areas, uh, White saying that Molina was responding to the reformers. Well, if this came X amount of hundreds of years later, and if Molina is responding to some uh, position that White affirms, well, then would it not be the case that his position just came just a few days prior to Molina responding to it? 
right? So it, you know, it cuts both ways. On on top of that, when you when you <laughs> look <of> at <laughs> right, good. I mean, if, if you're saying yeah. you know this this came ten years later, well, what is he doing? He's responding to something that came nine years before. Well, you're in the same time frame. Um, also, and and I'm I'm gonna tread carefully with this because uh, you know people can take it the wrong way or misinterpret what I'm saying. The principle here is this: when, when you look at the New Testament and Paul talks about mysteries. Um, what, what he means by that is not necessarily this is something that uh, this is something crazy that we just can't explain. It's usually he's usually talking about some some new item of revelation that is now being further unpacked and revealed to us. Now, imagine James White living in Paul's time and all they had was the Old Testament, right? Because the New Testament uh, uh, wasn't written yet. It was being written. So they didn't have this yet. And let's say they, they start talking about the doctrine of the Trinity. Could, could you imagine someone like White saying, wait a minute, we've had the Old Testament for so long, and this Trinity concept isn't coming up till X amount, hundreds or thousands of years later, you know? And I mean, it's, it's kind of, it's, I, I think, I don't think he'd tell that to Paul. Now, granted, I do think some people in the Old Testament had an awareness of this, but just kind of like what you said, Kurt Jarrow's a friend of ours, I read a great, great paper on Molinism at EPS, and he pointed out how some people already had this concept going on. And even Craig uh, points out how, you know, that they're, that it's alluded to, but it was Molina who kind of packaged it together like this. So, you know, we could call this a mystery in the sense that Paul uses it, but I, I don't I don't see how, how, how this, um, like you said, it's a genetic fallacy, it cuts both ways, and we even see this in the New Testament where things are being revealed and further unpacked even though it came X amount of years after the Old Testament was written. Well, and he also seems to criticize Molina individually, kind of an ad, hom uh, ad hominem towards Molina, uh, because he, him being a Jesuit who stood against the, the reformers in some areas of his theology, I guess. I don't know much about Molina myself, so I'm not trying to defend him one way or the other. I'm just simply saying, couldn't much of the same thing be said of Augustine, for example? Uh, he believed in baptismal regeneration of infants and believed in several doctrines that we, as I know, Baptists would not uh, adhere to today. Um, but whenever somebody um, shows respect for or honor for Augustine, they do so in the context of the theology they agree with, with regard to Augustine's writings and his genius, so to speak, of the things in which they agree, much like what they do with Calvin. They venerate Calvin as a, a great theologian, yet Many of them are very quick to say, I don't, that doesn't necessarily mean I agree with his, uh, his uh, treatment of heretics. Um, I actually disagree with his aspect of that. So in the same way, uh, it seems to me to be fair and to be consistent, not have a double standard there. You would say Craig is expressing his, uh, or, uh, his, his honor for or his love for Molina in respect to this particular doctrine, not necessarily saying that I therefore endorse everything that um, Molina ever said or did. Uh, that, that seems like a given to me uh, anyway. So um, we can we can move off that. Let's, let's it's go for good. Next. I mean, is is that a kind of a good example of Calvinism or could it just as easily no, be applied to a Molinism? It's a, a, a great Molinist example here. of Molinism. I <laughs> love the Joseph story because it so perfectly illustrates human freedom within the providence of God. You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good and has brought it this is why I was talking about the 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 question begging fallacy. You can't assume that your interpretation of the text is supporting your particular philosophical uh, underpinning. You have to establish that. And of course, both sides believe that these narratives are supported by their particular philosophical worldview. And so, w what was frustrating for me watching this is White's kind of dogmatic insistence that my interpretation must be the right one, therefore my philosophical worldview must be the right one, and it's derived from the text, um, not from philosophy. Uh, and and it, it seems to me that he's he's question-begging in that regard because he seems to be assuming his philosophy is true and therefore interpreting the text with that grid, all the while accusing uh, <laughs> White of doing the same thing. You're reading it from your grid. You're reading it with your presuppositions and a lack of self-awareness of recognizing his own deterministic presuppositions. And that's what we're trying to push push back on. To pass. God didn't move the brothers to hate Joseph, to kill him, to throw him into a pit, to lie to their father. That would make... Notice what he says there. God does not move the desire, the hatred, the pride, the lust. In other words, he does not 
causally determinate. He does not decree it in the sense of the Calvinistic form of decree. He does not move them to it. Whatever verb you want to use, he is not the one who is responsible for the cause of, the origin of, the author of, the hate and the pride and the lust and the sinful inclinations of the brothers. That is the point. On Calvinism, you have to say that God is the origin of it because the decree is the origin of everything on Calvinism. And I don't, I, I don't know why that is such a controversial statement with regard to what the two systems are entailing and why one side insists on saying very intelligent, very well-read men like William Lee Craig just don't understand what Calvinism is by saying something that clear and plain. What do you think, Eric? Am I being unfair? No, no. I, yeah, I, I, like I said earlier, you know, we want to be clear with our language. And I think when you can uh, not oversimplify, but just simplify into precise language to, to point out exactly what you mean, then you can let people decide rather than, and I'm not accusing White of doing this, but rather than use language that can be interpreted in different ways and just kind of leave it up to whoever sounds more pious. Right. Yeah, well said. God the author of evil, but God knew that if they were in this situation, they would behave in these evil ways, but that ultimately this would uh, redound to the salvation of Israel and its rescue from famine and, and all the rest. So if anything else you want to say about that, I think uh, Craig pretty much said it, said it all. <laughs> yeah. All right, let's move on was trying to be communicated by Joseph, that Joseph had this idea. No, he I'm understood, not saying that. He understood, Joseph understood why, if that's true, if this is a picture of Molinism, why did God have to restrain the brothers from killing Joseph? Didn't he know that that's what they would want? And if determinism is true, why did he have to restrain from them killing Moses? Why, why, why not just not decree for them to want to kill Moses or, or to kill their brother? Sorry, I don't know where Moses came from. That again, he, it cuts both ways. His argument is cutting both ways, and I don't know that he has any uh, enough self awareness to re recognize that or not. But it seems to me. Well, explain from the Molinist perspective how you would answer that argument. Instead, of, I don't want to do just the U two fallacy. I think U two applies here because I think the determinist has a bigger issue than the Molinist does in answering that question as to why he needs to restrain people from decreeing to, from from doing what he's decreed for them to want to do. Um, I think he has to answer that question as a Calvinist. But how would the Molinist answer that question if an open theist asked it, for example? Why does he need to restrain these brothers from killing if, why not just Molinistically change the circumstances or whatever it may be? I, I don't know. How, how would you reply to that? Well, well, as um, I don't know if we're going to play Craig's reply or not. Oh, excuse me. But uh, Craig does, uh, uh, he, he gives it uh, the Molinistic answer that I would definitely agree with. We're basically, uh, um, God uses means, and of course, means only mean something if you're dealing with libertarianly free creatures. Um, so in other words, um, the brothers were moved – because God doesn't control the free decisions of creatures, then had they uh, – in that situation, they would have all things being equal, would have went through and killed uh, a Joseph. However, God – uh, uh, said about some circumstances, as Craig will point out later, where one of the brothers says, well, wait a minute, why don't we do this instead? In other words, we could say, had this brother not spoken up, they would have killed him. So God, using their free decisions, created a world in which one of the brothers spoke up and said something, which in that sense restrained what they were wanting and willing to do. So this is the hands-off approach. Uh, uh, White later kind of uh, tongue-in-cheek says, that, you know, there's a lot of hands-on here. This goes back to what I was saying earlier about micro-planning versus micro-causing. Um, yes, God can divinely intervene in any situation, but if God split the Red Sea through some, un, you know, some earthquakes of tectonic plate shifting, and that timing was the time in which when they prayed, this Red Sea split, then it's a hands-off approach. God is not directly intervening and causing these things but has micro plan, not micro cause these things to happen in which it is a miracle in the sense of the timing. And God is using these natural things to occur. And he just sets up the situation, getting his outcome using their free decisions. Well said. He literally violated their creaturely freedom by restraining but, them from killing Joseph. You know, I want to touch on that real quick. Remember the old. Okay. Right. Um, so, so again, it's, it's, it's the language. He says God literally violated their free will. No, he didn't. Um, it, this, 
I'd have to know it a little bit more, you know, he'd have to expound that more, but I can gather this much. Um, if I, if suppose I, someone were to tie my hands down, could I freely will to lift my hand up? Yes. Could, would I be able to carry out my free will and lift my hand up? No. Note the distinction. There's a difference in between freely willing something versus being able to carry out physically the very thing that you will. To say that God, so in other words, even if you literally restrain my arm, you are not restraining my will. My will is is something metaphysical. It's a right. volition within my soul. It's not my body. Restraining my body is not restraining my will. Um, you know, right. and I've used other examples. So even if someone were to literally restrain my arms, I can still, you know, if someone's, you know, being kidnapped or whatever, you know, they may, you know, tie them up. Well, they're, that person's going to try to escape. Are they refraining their will to escape? No, they're just inhibiting their ability to carry out their free will. So first, right. no, God's even if if what White's implying was true, that wouldn't be refraining their will. And and no, nothing was. Uh, uh, they wanted to kill him. They just didn't because the other brother said, "Hey, let's go with this option instead." And even in that, by them deciding to go with that option. That was still their free will. God wasn't yeah. doing anything to their will. He was allowing influence to play into the fact, knowing how they would respond in this given situation. Well, well said. Derek uh, makes a good point in the side chat here. He says, White is essentially treating it as though William Lane Craig believes God only uses middle knowledge and doesn't actively act in human history. Um, you think that's fair, Eric? A, a fair assessment? Uh, yeah, it, it's it sounds like it sounds like uh, um, uh, to, to a large extent it does sound like that because even Craig, you know, at, at some point has said, you know, I don't deny divine intervention. Craig's just saying we don't need a direct divine intervention to explain this, and especially if that divine intervention takes away human freedom. If we're going to grant human freedom, uh, um, then God's not going to be causing to determine micro causing these things. He's going to be setting up the situation. Which again, and, and when I say set up the situation, I don't even mean that in a micro causing. It's not as if God put the pieces in place. It's that God is so great, omniscient, and wonderful that he considers everything within the entire possible world knowing how it play out. So these free creatures place themselves in these situations, and there's a variety of situations that, that are possible, and God chooses a one in which he gets his desired outcome through the actions of free creatures. Yeah, this is, uh, went, we went back and forth on a Twitter exchange kind of talking about this as well, is that this whole concept of intervention seems to presuppose that there's something outside of God's will to intervene in. In other words, for God to intervene, i.e. to impose himself into human circumstances to bring about, for example, the crucifixion or the inspiration of scripture or something like that, seems to presuppose that there are things outside of God's will happening in the world that in which he's intervening, which is why we would pray, God, let your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven, which seems to presuppose that God's will is not always being done here on earth as it is in heaven in that in that in that sense. Um, and so anyway, uh, let, let's let's move well, on. I will go ahead. Yeah, go I, ahead. I, I want to say one more one more thing on that, because that, that's interesting. You bring up prayer um, and without going into this rabbit hole, but just a quick application here, um, because, yeah, you know, you may think, uh, um, you know, well, well, then why pray or whatnot? Um I'll, I'll just say this without unpacking it. I'm not sure, you know, how the Calvinists would answer this, but uh, I mean, it, if God is causing all things and, you know, and I've heard some Calvinists say, you know, prayer doesn't change God, it changes you. I, I disagree, but let me, let me jump to the Mullis perspective because here's where I want to get to. God knows that if Eric prays for X, God will make it, whether through divine intervention or Mullinism, God will make it the case that X is brought about. If Eric does not pray for X, then God will not make it the case that X comes about. Note, even in through prayer, God could have this type of middle knowledge, again, uh, with all the implications of Molinism. Um, same thing with uh, – um, I'm hesitant to go here, but I'm just going to throw it out there and leave it alone. Now, I don't believe in backward causation. Uh, uh, and without going into that, in other words, um, you know, people ask, can you, can you pray for something that happened in the past? Um, again, without, without jumping too deep and opening this can of worms, I'll say this. Um, I, I, th there is um, – there's, there's a story that Moreland uses in his new book on miracles, and I've heard it in, in his other book, Kingdom Triangle. Essentially, there are these uh, this missionary in Africa, and um, long story short, uh, this mother gives birth but dies at birth, and it's now you know she leaves a, a like a ten year old girl and a new month uh, a newborn baby, and the the problem is that at night it gets really cold over there, so cold that the baby uh, uh, could freeze to death. 
So um, they have these uh, hot water bottles that they fill up with hot water and they use them to sleep with uh, for, for the babies. Uh, the only one they had, though, ended up bursting. Um, so the next morning in prayer, uh, when the missionary was like l teaching the Sunday school, she asked the kids, hey, what should we pray for today? And the missionary always taught that, you know, God can answer any prayer. And so uh, the, the little girl, of course, says, well, pray that someone would send us a hot water bottle in the mail and pray that um, that, in fact, because God can do anything, pray that God would uh, send a, a little dolly so that that the, the bigger sister can know that God loves her. Now, the missionary was very hesitant to pray this because they hadn't received mail package in months and it takes five months to even get there. So even if they could call someone on the phone and say, here's what we need, it wouldn't get there to five months later. Again, trying to keep the story brief. The mail comes, which was first a surprise because of how long it takes. And when they open it, uh, they start, you know, pulling, there's some clothes in there and whatnot. And then the woman reaches down with hesitation and fills some some rubbery plastic, pulls it out. It's a hot water bottle. And the little girl, and I'm trying not to cry when I say this because almost every time I do, the little girl says, if God sent the water bottle, look for the dolly. Don't cry, Eric. <laughs> she reaches in and pulls it out. And on the tag, it said for a little girl in Africa so that she knows God loves her. Now, this was sent five months prior to – to this prayer being prayed, which means God must have known that this prayer would have been prayed and had it uh, ordained and, and uh, ordered the situation so that five months before this prayer, this Sunday school group uh, just randomly chose, I say randomly from our perspective, chose to send a package and they prayed, what should we send them? Who in the world would think to send a hot water bottle to the middle of Africa? <laughs> you know, yeah. but they did. So yeah, wow. even in our well, prayers, God knows. I can't fathom a way that God could pull that off, so he must not have been able to do it. All right? <laughs> yeah. See, that, where that's, where, that's where we, we talk about how I don't know exactly how God may do what he does, but I can still believe that God miraculously pulls off uh, things like this all the time in our world. And we hear stories like this from missionaries and uh, laymen alike. I mean, we, we hear stories of God uh, demonstrating himself through uh, cool stories like that and how God provides. Um, I, I do want to entertain from uh, one of our friends who's more of a dynamic guy, uh, Brian Wagner, who's been on the program several times and I consider a dear friend. Uh, he's he's asking this question, so you might be able to help him out, Eric, because um, I don't know how to answer it. Um, God is not making free will decisions after creation that could be called interventions according to Molinism because God chose all his free will decisions to shape all outcomes to work out one way before creating others with free wills. Right. That seems to be similar to what White is arguing against uh, Craig's Molinism in that discussion. So how would you respond to Brian? Well, well, a few things, because I, I think what he's asking, it, I, I, the way the question is worded, I'll say it this way, um, because it sounds like he's saying that if God chooses ahead of time what he will do, then it's no longer a free decision because that decision is now fixed, given what he chose logically prior to creation. But note he says that God chose all his free will decisions. Well, were the decisions that God made free? Yes. Well, then they're they're free, right? Otherwise, you can't call them free will decisions. And uh, on top of that, I can, like, let's say my, uh, so my family has taken a, a couple vacation trips. Uh, um, and let's say we're going to take one next summer. We're going to take a vacation. I'm going to choose ahead of time what uh, what uh, what package we're going to get. And I'm, I'm going to choose ahead of time. Okay, when we land here, we're going to go to this restaurant, then visit this store, then visit, you know, the, the gift shop, which means I have chosen ahead of time what I will do when I get to the situation. Now, when I get to the situation and I carry out what I've freely chosen, am I still free? Well, yes, because I freely chose it in the first place and I'm freely carrying out what I decided to do when I'm in that situation. So it, uh, it, it, it doesn't take away God's freedom to choose what he will do beforehand and then freely carry out what he already chose to do. Yeah. Derek and Derek and uh, Brian are having kind of a side chat discussion. He's and he's, he replies and says, Brian is confusing necessity and certainty again, which he has been told time and time again is a modal fallacy. You can't get around that. It's plain and simple logic. Disagreeing with logic is odd. Um, in other words, what he seems to be arguing, Derek is pushing back on Brian saying just because something is certainly known, even God's own decision to act in this way or to choose this or to make this decision intervention in this way to intervene in this way, just because that is something that God certainly knows will happen and even intends to do doesn't necessarily make uh, it, it uh, uh, determined by something other 
somebody, the free choice is determined by somebody other than himself, which is where the point you were making, I think, is that if it's a free decision, it's a free decision, regardless of quote unquote, when in uh, a time bound world, uh, linear way of thinking when that decision was made, which that's when it gets into very philosophical and I, and I, would, I can't wrap, I can't wrap my brain around it. I like to drive you nuts, Eric. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and and it would still be an intervention because that was part of the question too. It would still be an intervention yeah. because all you would have to say is that God is going to choose to intervene at this point. And okay. yeah, it, it would still be. All right. Good job. Well said. Let's, let's move there on. There had to, to be brought in to do right. that. Right. And so he, why, how does that, how does anything where God hardens hearts so that nations are destroyed, hardens Pharaoh's heart. He, he restrains evil with, with Abimelech. He restrains evil with Joseph's brothers. This seems to be God acting against autonomous actions of men. If middle knowledge gave him the basis for just putting him in the proper situations, why would he ever have to then, as, as Justin put it earlier, if it's a hands-off thing, how, much, how come there's so much hands getting involved here? <laughs> well, I certainly wouldn't mean to deny God's miraculous intervention in the series of secondary causes. But in the case, for example, uh, was it Reuben who said, let's not kill Joseph, let's throw him in the pit? What we can say is that God knew that th this brother would do that and that the others would freely listen to him rather than say that God is determining them to act in this way. That Okay, so I, I think... Uh, um, Craig clarifies there that God knows and uses doesn't determine. And that includes even the better choice. There, there's a better choice there of the older brother to sell versus kill. It's still a sinful choice, but it is a better sinful choice, a better option than, uh, than the other. So God can know something that's a sinful choice without being the cause of that sinful choice. Just like he can know Peter is going to deny Christ three times without being the cause of Peter's denial. Um, Anything else you want to say on that before we move to the next section? Uh, nope. Yeah, because it, it, it's already touched a lot of what we said, and then of course Craig puts it nicely. Good deal. Because because you you said something I didn't get a chance to get back to it. You said that the whole history of the world, up to the point of a human decision, yes. is taken into consideration in the decree. Yes. And my point is that the gifts that are given to me, when I'm going to live what my intelligent level is going to be, who my siblings are. Those are all a part of the decree. They cannot, right. they are part of the decree that God has made for me. So I challenge the idea that there is a, a, an essence of James White that exists outside of God's decree to make James White as James White is, that could be known as to what I would do apart from the free expression of God's decree in making me who I am. Because it sounds to me like you're saying who I am is not the result of the expression of God's freedom. It was something God knew, but how we knew, we don't know. For okay. okay. So this gets into quite a few problems because, uh, one, he's implicitly conceding that God can't know something unless he creates it. At least that's the way he worded it. That's what it sounds like. So now you're saying God can't be omniscient unless he causes something. If you want to take that definition of, of – yeah, that's, that's between you and God, I suppose. But on top of that, I, here's where I want to touch on the more the metaphysical point that he's trying to make. And it's, it's – it's, setting James White aside, I've always said bad philosophy is going to inevitably lead to bad theology. And that's not just with respect to God, even doctrine of man and any and everything. So he talks about – he says, I um, – he says that he denies that uh, he challenges the idea that there is an essence of James White that exists outside of God's decree to make James White. So that's what we just said. And of course, there's no essence of James White that actually exists uh, because it hasn't been created. But he also seems to assume that if if God would have created James White to live somewhere else or be born somewhere different, he wouldn't be James White because it. He may bring it up later. Um, uh, well, yeah, he will bring it up later, so I'll just kind of set that aside. But basically, that goes back to the accidental properties versus essential properties. I can change my hair color and still be Eric. There's nothing about my hair yeah. color that makes me who I am. And he's confusing right. that and then, again, assuming that unless God decrees it, he can't know it. And so he asks, well, how can he know it without 
whatever it was you said that was just it's it's all over the place gotcha uh that we want to engage with and so uh let's just jump in here we go there is no essence of james white whether a cologne or otherwise because if i was living someplace else at a time that wouldn't be me I am who I am because God created me and placed me in this particular place. Is there not? Okay. So do you want to address that? Um, the essence of James White discussion. Matter of fact, there's already memes out there of cologne that James White's going to put out. So the, <laughs> I didn't know if you want to talk about that at all. Yeah. So, so like I was saying, this is where, okay, he's confusing a person's nature or essence with their character or personality. It's not the same thing. Um, this is without going too deep into, you know, strict identity of personhood. Um, suppose, God forbid, I were to get in some type of accident that would uh, perhaps have brain damage that would severely alter my character. And we have examples of this in history where, you know, someone was a relatively nice person and then, you know, the, uh, some train spike went through their head. They survived, but then they were like very vile, aggressive, mean, uh, became a mean person. Is that a different person? No. Uh, again, without going to the details, what White is saying is is he's denying and challenging, uh, which is a horrible objection to Molinism based on a bad philosophical presuppositions about the nature of man and the soul, essentially, is that if James White, if he were created somewhere else, he wouldn't be James White. Well, of course he would. If you move today, if James White moved today to Africa, would he still be James White? Of course he would. So so uh, it, it's, in other words, he's saying that in the let me put it this way. There could be a, a, another possible world, hypothetically, not that exists. H possible worlds are hypotheticals. Let's suppose God would ha uh, that there's a possible world in which God could have created James White in Africa instead of being born wherever he was born. He denies that because he says that wouldn't be me. So he's trying to say that there's some type of objection on the basis of personal identity through change and confuses essential properties with accidental properties. What, no matter wherever I'm born, I'm still Eric Hernandez. I'm still me. And if there is a possible world in which God could have created me to be born or, uh, in, in a different place, I'd still be me. So his objection seems to presuppose that everything about you is necessary. Here's one more problem, and then we can move on. That would arise from that is that um, if he's a, his position is essentially implying that what you are is a collection of properties and and, and accidental uh, um attributes that you have you know i have the ability to speak spanish um all that according to what white is saying it seems to be that all this comprises me well then what happens when i when i learn to speak french am i now a different person because i'm, I'm no longer that bundle at time one and at time two i can now speak french now i have one more added or suppose again i get you know head damage and i forget how to speak spanish did eric hernandez cease to exist and a lookalike came into existence and then when I get it back, I come back into existence and the other guy leaves. It, it, it's, it's, such a, it's such a bad metaphysical confusion on so many levels. And to try and use that as an objection to Molinism, like I said, bad, the bad philosophy leads to bad theology. Uh, well said. Somebody on the side chat said, I look angry. That's my thinking face when I'm trying to, <laughs> when I'm trying to, when I'm trying to figure out, when I'm trying to get my brain around something. Um, <laughs> well, that, that, that's why you're thinking. Will so you hard. admit then? <laughs> that there is no text that we can go to that you can point to and says that specifically teaches Molinism. That's that's where not. middle knowledge I, comes said from. That. Of course you can't. Okay. Neither can so, you go to a text in scripture that teaches unilateral divine determinism. But I but I've already <laughs> That's exactly right. Just like you can't go to a text that teaches Molinism, you can't go to a text that teaches uh, EDD, exhaustive divine determinism. You, you don't find either one of them in the text. Why? Because they are philosophical theories created years later to answer a question that the Bible doesn't specifically address, which is one of the reasons I don't, as a theologian, take a hard stance on that issue and cast out Calvinist as unbelievers and cast out open theists as unbelievers and class out any other group out there that have unbelievers, because this is a secondary philosophical issue that has, that has been a de de long debated uh, topic throughout Christian history. And if God's grace doesn't cover that, then God help us all. Um, I, I'm sorry. I get on my, my soapbox on that one, but do you want to, do you want to say anything on that point before I move on? No, that was, yeah, we can move on. That was good. All right. Already, then I'd like to, to know what you do with Ephesians 1.11. What prior to Molina's... By the way, Ephesians 1.11 is present active. God presently active is working all things for whom? For those who are in Christ Jesus. It's exactly what he says in Romans 
God works all things together for good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. It does not mean he's the author of evil. It doesn't mean he's the determiner of evil. It means that he works all things together for good for those who love him. In other words, he can turn and redeem evil things to good, and he will do that for whom? People unilaterally pay for the foundation of the world? No. Those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Those who are in Christ through faith. I don't know what else needs to be said about that, but the interpretation that James White is assuming is in Romans 11, can't be assumed, it has to be established, and just to, to assume that his interpretation must be the right one based upon a deterministic premise uh, should be called out in debates like this, and I think uh, Craig did call him out for that. Uh, anything else you want to say on that, Eric? No, move, to move to right undo first. the preaching of the Reformation, um, theologians understood that there were two kinds of knowledge in God, his natural knowledge and his free knowledge, and there is no difficulty in looking at any text of scripture that has been raised in seeing it as part of his natural knowledge or his free knowledge. How do we know who rulers are? They're created by God. How do we know how they could have anything to do with the crucifixion of Christ? Because they were put in that position by God's decree. That is the very essence of these things. This flows from the free expression of God in sovereignly ordering the things that he does. So there's all sorts of counterfactuals, but that doesn't mean that these counterfactuals come from someplace we haven't been told from where as yet, that they are somehow truths that can determine the feasible worlds. And okay, you want to you want to touch on that one? Yeah. So so first of all, he's he he seems to whether uh, intentional or not confuse how we know something versus how God knows something. For example, he because he he uses human beings as an example. He says um, like how how do we know who the rulers are because they're created by God. Uh, how do we know how they would have, how they could uh, have done anything to do with the crucifixion because they're put in that position by God's decree? In other words, how do I know something after the fact or after it's done or after it's created? But please don't apply that to God. God doesn't know it that way. So, for, so that's a, a really big mistake I make. So again, whether intentional or not, to confuse our epistemic way of knowing something versus God's inherent omniscience and way of knowing things. Um, and again, he, he goes back to the question we've heard at least three, maybe four times. Where does it come from? It doesn't come from God, right? Because God doesn't cause the action of free creatures. And, and, and I forgot what, out, what other things he's saying. But then he, he's basically saying that God knows the counterfactuals because— God caused it, but that, which which could be paraphrased or, or excuse me reworded to say, well, God knows that if He would have done something else, He would have known that other thing. But if God would have caused Him to do something else, He would have known this other thing. Well, right? If God causes something, sure, you can say God knows counterfactuals of what He would have caused Him to do. But then that's not middle knowledge, and and I I don't know if He's trying to say that that that's what it is. But regardless. It, it it it's it's not even an objection at that point, and and I think he's making quite a bit of mistakes there. Yeah, well, well said. Explain a bit more, James. I'd love you to explain this. Then, what what why why do you disagree fundamentally that that God is effectively the author of evil in this? Well, well, and that's that's what I keep saying. He keeps saying that that God is moving people's wills to do things. He is restraining evil. God is not sitting. We aren't a bunch of innocent individuals and God's putting his gun in his back of our hand. Go, go do evil things that the, no, nowhere has that has that been been so, even hinted at. OK, so, I don't know of anyone who's ever said that God is putting gun to people's heads, <laughs> but go ahead. Yeah. So so a few things is um so so he, he and we're going to hear it again later where he's, he's kind of complaining about the philosophy thing. But his very view that God that God knows counterfactuals because he causes them, where is that in Scripture? It's not. It's from his philosophical presupposition of determinism. So, so you know, it, hypocritical at best there. Um, and then the, the text says that what you intended for evil, God intended for good. It doesn't say what God intended you to intend, he used to intend something else. So, you know, it's... Right. It, the, the way it's stated sounds very much like like what something we would agree with in our position. Um, and, and then he, like you just said, the whole putting the gun to the back thing. First of all, that wouldn't be cause of determination. And, and I, I honestly, from what I've heard, especially in this in this broadcast that he's done, I, I don't know if he understands compatibilism or determination because to be determined doesn't mean you force someone in this popular level sense to where you put a gun to their head because – 
technically the person could still refrain from doing it. That's not forcing, that's not constantly determining someone to do something. You could put a gun to my head, tell me to do something. And I say, no, and you shoot me. So it's not forcing. That's an influence. But that's not a cause. Right. So when, right. when, when Craig is talking about moving, like we've already talked about, he's talking about a cause of determination that you're not the first mover. And that has nothing to right. do with, you know, being in a hostage situation by God. Right. It's almost like he, he doesn't know that William Lane Craig is not to saying that God's moving him by, by an external forceful means like a gun to the head kind of a situation. Um, obviously, he's talking about the sovereign decree of the Calvinistic worldview, that God sovereignly and unchangeably decrees whatsoever comes to pass. That's what he's talking about, the word move. He moves them by sovereign causal decree. That's what he's talking about. And the, so in order not to have to deal with that problem, it seems to me, and I, I can't I can't speak to the motives of White here, but it seems to me instead of having to deal with that problem, I would rather go over here and paint a straw man, i.e. William Lane Craig thinks that God's out there forcing people by guns to the back of their heads to do stuff against their will on determinism. And that's not at all what he's saying. He's talking about philosophical determinism, just like the whole debate is about <laughs> the philosophical determinism of dealing with the problem of evil in the world. And so when asked the question, how do you as a Calvinist deal with, with the problem of evil, instead of dealing with it, he 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 borrows from our vocabulary. He he butters the bread on our table, so to speak, by doing what? God restrains evil. What what is he restraining if not his own decree? Decreeing them to be evil, to do evil, to want to do evil, and then restraining them from doing what he decreed for them to want to do. Again, I wish um, somebody would have pushed him on that in this discussion. But they just kind of time wise didn't allow you to always hit on every point. But I would love for a uh, someone like James White to be in a cross examination and to be pushed on that point because I would like to know where he goes with it. If God decrees one to want to do something and then restrains them from doing that which He decreed them to want to do, then how is God restraining anything other than His own decree? And that doesn't make any any rational sense to me, as far as I can tell. That Moving. God cannot save certain people because of it and when i say it you say you can't ask where it comes from because that's some truth maker thing i think it's just simply something that is absolutely necessary if we're going to take middle knowledge seriously right i mean that you you do admit that you've said that there are certain people that in no feasible world can they be saved it's more okay you want to address that point yeah, and so so a few things, and and if I can even just back to the the gun behind your head illustration, uh, if to to peel back another few layers really quick is when it, it's helpful to know a person's position because the objections or statements they make are always going to be embedded with their presuppositions of what their position is. So, right. um, in other words, white what white's implying is that God's not putting a gun to their head, forcing them to do evil. They want and desire to do evil, but as we talked about earlier, we'll go one more onion layer behind that one. Why do they want that? Well, as, as I already said, and as White said, these are the gifts. Of course, he wouldn't call these gifts, but these are things that God decreed for the person to be part of. And according to uh, Dr. White's um, doctrine of man and the metaphysics of the soul and personal identity through change, then these are inherently a part of the person that God decreed. And so you don't have to put a gun to their head because they want to do evil. So it's their fault, but time out. Why do they want it? Because that's what God decreed for them to want and desire. And given compatibilism, your greatest desires causally determine necessarily your actions. Well said. Uh, I think that summarizes it real, real well. Plausible. Yes. And, and I believe that the standard for a Christian should not be plausibility. The standard for a Christian should be consistency with the essence of divine revelation. But there are multiple views which are consistent with Scripture. And, and that's the point we were going to uh, in the last episode. We talked about that and uh, several times in this episode. You can't just assume your worldview, beg the question. Uh, you, you must make an argument that your interpretation has to be the right one and not use any philosophy while doing so. <laughs> good luck. Good luck with that. I do believe, Bill. Honestly, I'm one of those guys over here that really, really believes that what I believe about the attributes of God does come forth from the text of Scripture. Not, it's not something that's that's out here someplace. So, at least you can understand why I find it so deeply troubling that there would be a claim being made that when I press upon that claim and say, you're saying God cannot do certain things in light of this, 
Where does that come from? It doesn't come from anywhere. It just is, and it's a great theological insight. Okay. Doesn't come from anywhere. It's just this the card player analogy thing that get, that comes up sometimes with with why who's whoever's dealing the cards that's the person we should be worshiping white will say because that's the person because you know Craig is known for saying uh, God is dealing with the cards he's been dealt with regard to when he chooses to make free creatures then free creatures are going to be just that they're going to be free and then for, therefore God is going to work within a world of where free creatures are making free decisions and white will play off of this and say well I I want to worship the card dealer because he's obviously the one with all the power. And it seems to be the same kind of point he's making here. What say you? So, so yeah, he's asking the, the question again. And and no, Craig's not saying it doesn't come from anywhere as if we have no explanation for it. The explanation has been given. It's just not one that White affirms because White thinks God only knows it because he either decrees it and causes it or he has to know it after he creates it. So it's not that it doesn't come from anywhere. It doesn't come from anywhere that white presupposes it comes from it comes from god's omniscience that's where his knowledge it's it's inherent to him and the plausibility thing i think we have another clip where he 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 may bring it up but but he he brings up trans world damnation here is is what he's essentially talking about and this is essentially the view that um and and i tend to lean this way the people that are lost in this world uh are people who would not have chosen god in any other feasible world um because uh as a side note and application to just the Molinism perspective, um, there is a possible world, I'd say, where I did not choose Christ. So I am thankful. It, it is by God's decision to create this world and my free choice to respond to his gift of salvation that I am saved. But God could have chosen me in a world in which I did not accept salvation. That frightens me. And because it would be God's prerogative to do that, and it would still be my free choice. On the other side, and I'm thankful that so I'm creating a word in which I chose him freely. On the other hand, when you look at the other side of the, the coin, well, what about the people who are not saved? Well, Craig, uh, if I'm not mistaken, would hold to, and like I said, I lean this way, that the people that are lost in this world uh, would have rejected him in any, any other world. And and this kind of helps even uh, at least give a, a plausible answer to what about maybe, because some people might say, what about those who never hear the gospel? One response is that, well, this these could be those people who, who uh, would have rejected him. And I think it's a sign of God's grace, because I would argue the more revelation you're given, the greater the condemnation you have for rejecting that revelation. So if God puts you in a place that you're secluded and never hear the gospel, then in essence, even that's his grace, because now your condemnation is not as greater as it would have been had you heard the gospel and still rejected it. So mm -hmm. then this is why uh, Craig says that this Molinism has such rich application to so many uh, uh, other areas. Um, and like I said, I think he'll bring up the plausibility thing later. But what he's he's doing here is he's confusing the doctrine of Molinism versus application. Because um, I don't know if we are going to play it, but Craig says, well, I don't want to go down that rabbit hole or elite us a hole. And White yeah. laughs and says, well, that's the point, as if Craig's dodging. First of all, the discussion is about the problem of evil, not trans world damnation. And it's not as if Craig hasn't answered and written about this elsewhere. Um, the, the point is, this isn't inherent to the discussion, and not all Molinists hold to this application. So you cannot right. confuse an application of Molinism and use that and object to it as if that somehow objects to the doctrine of Molinism. Yeah, well said. Um, some of you may have seen me roll my eyes while Eric was talking. I was not rolling my eyes at Eric. <laughs> I read the side chat comments sometimes, and uh, sometimes I see comments that I roll my eyes at without re realizing people can see me still. So <laughs> sorry about that, Eric. Uh, what did I, did I, here's what I was rolling my eyes at, to be honest, Derek. Derek in the side chat is saying, how could a Christian not have scripture as a standard? We all have scripture as a standard, just, just so you know. From there... Uh, from there is a study and interpretation. Sure, but Craig admitted Molinism isn't even scriptural. <sighs> Do we need to say it again, Derek? Did you just tune in? Did you not listen to the beginning of the program? Uh, that's not what uh, Dr. Craig said. Um, it would be as if, if we had two intellectually honest people debating, uh, Helm, let's say, and uh, William Lane Craig, and Helm said, oh, well, of course, um, Philosophical determinism, i.e. this concept of compatibilism, is not explicitly taught in Scripture, but this is what we derive from um, these per certain passages like Ephesians uh, you know, 1 or uh, Genesis 50. We derive from these texts this concept and idea of the worldview of what we call compatibilism. That's exactly what Craig was saying from the Molinistic perspective. Um, 
he, he said that you have to understand these things from a biblical uh, uh, underpinning that we can derive truths like the omniscience of God, like the uh, omni uh, presence and omnipotence of God, that God is all places at all times. He is, he is maximally glorious. He is maximally good. He's not sinful. We derive all those things from Scripture. And yes, we derive, yet men are responsible and make real choices. And now how those two work together are the philosophical answers that are being theorized here. I, I think it's really important uh, that we, we do not mistaken uh, his comments that, that these things aren't specifically taught in Scripture to say, therefore, Molinism or this theory is not based uh, or, or is not biblically uh, consistent because that's exactly what, what he was arguing. Um, I, I think we've said that enough. Uh, we can probably move on to another point. Let's, let's go to the next section here. I think there's only a little bit more left here. Uh, no one said that they are simply read out of Scripture as if you just simply have the chapter on simplicity or the chapter on anything else. Okay, so no one said they are simply read in scripture. So what do you have to add if they're not just simply read out of scripture? He's he's conceding the very point that he was arguing earlier. If it's not simply, what are you adding, James White? You're adding what? A philosophical worldview. That's what you have to be using philosophy in order to, in, to, to bring your interpretation to bear, i.e. philosophical compatibilism. And if you think that philosophical compatibilism isn't philosophical, I can't help you. Okay, you've got to admit both views are philosophical, and and I think be humble enough to admit neither one of them are thus saith the Lord. Both of them are theories, and therefore you have to treat them as such. You want to say something about that, Eric? Yeah. Uh, yeah so so there's a, a few things to consider. One, uh, for a long time, especially you know uh, the, the Christians, the early church, a lot of them didn't have, uh, probably didn't have. Uh, well, the, first of all, they didn't have the New Testament, you know, still being written. Um, there's people around the world who who don't have Bibles. There, there, there was a time in which Scripture had not been written. Are people honestly thinking that we did know nothing about God? Uh, I, I think that'd be a horrible argument to make. Um, on top of that, you look at something like Romans 120, and it says it says something interesting that sounds like a a, a contradiction at face value. It says that ever since the creation of the world, God's invisible attributes. Are, uh, have been made known and are clearly seen. How can something invisible be clearly seen? It's an intentional wordplay there. And it's, it's essentially saying that by looking at the nature of creation, we can deduce the attributes, the invisible attributes of God. So yes, we have scripture, absolutely. Um, but what scripture is telling us here is that we also have creation and that creation yes. can help us understand, know, and deduce logically, which takes philosophy, the, the attributes of God. So you look at something like the Kalam cosmological argument. I, I won't share it here, but you know the conclusion of the argument would give us a God that is um, that uh, logically prior to creation was timeless, spaceless, immaterial, supernatural, unimaginably powerful, personal, and free. All those attributes from the fact that the universe had a beginning. So uh, I think everyone starts with philosophy. I, I don't think to, to say you don't start with philosophy is a philosophical starting point. And, and it, it, it's going to be, it, it's like asking this, and, and I don't want to spend too much more time on this, but it's like ask, I asked one time a uh, presuppositionalist, I said, what comes first, grammar or reading scripture? And they said, reading scripture. Uh, how could scripture be written without grammar? You know, and, and I don't, to me, it's just, it's, it's, a, it's an attempt to be pious, or maybe it's, it's just ignorance on how philosophy does undergird a, a lot of things, but I'll leave it there. Yeah, yeah well, well said is that we have seen that the central claim of middle knowledge is not grounded, it is not sourced, and yet it is used to delimit what God's decree can do. That is why I believe it must be rejected. You want to address that? Yeah, and, and even even because earlier, uh, um, something else that, that I, I just remembered was he said that there's something that delimits that God can't save these people. This is when he was talking about the trans world damnation. And again, words need to be clear. Given trans world damnation, these people freely reject God in any feasible world God would create them in. Create them in. So it's not that God can't save them. God can save them. It's that they reject him. And if he's going to allow them to be free, then God still has the ability to save them. It's just that if he, he's going to allow them to make a free choice and they freely eject, it's not that they he can't save them. He can, but they don't want salvation. 
So, so e even the language that he uses is just, it's not the right language to say that God can't, you know, if, if I, if, so my wife and I've been married for uh, seven years, when I proposed, she said, yes, um, uh, can she, mar could, could I marry her? Yes. She said, yes. Now, if she said no, could I marry her? Well, if I could, you mean, do I have the ability and capacity to marry her? Yeah, I still do. But if she says no, you know, anything else would be a force. So to say that God can't save these people is incorrect, especially given free will and Molinism. It's that he can, but they've rejected him freely. Right. Well, well said. The evil that exists, God knew would exist yes. when he looked at the feasible worlds. Yes. And yet he brought this evil into existence, but not for any purpose in revealing his own character? No, he didn't bring the evil into existence, James. He brought into existence the circumstances and the free creatures in them, knowing the, how, how they would choose. And so his permissive will is to allow creatures to do things that his absolute will disagrees with. His absolute will is that in any situation, a creature would always do the right thing but he knows that often they will do evil things. And so he permits that to happen with a view toward these greater goods, like saving Israel from famine in Egypt, bringing the judgment upon apostate Israel, achieving the crucifixion of Jesus through the evil machinations of the rulers of this world. Uh, all of these things transpire with a view toward God's sovereign purposes for humanity. Um, but what I just want to resist with every fiber of my being is that God moves creatures to do evil. Well, that, 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 that I ended with that one because I think Dr. Craig really sums up the whole issue is I want to resist with every fiber of my being uh, this insinuation that God moves creatures to do evil. That seems to fly in the face of divine revelation. And we want to hold scripture up as authority. We, you know, they kept pounding on that, that drum about scripture being our authority. Okay. Well, if scripture is our authority and the scripture says that God doesn't tempt men to evil and that pride and lust are not from the father, but from the world. And that whenever they were killing their children to Malek, that I did not decree it, nor did it even enter my mind. Um, and over and over and over again, God, how God doesn't even look upon evil and how God is holy, 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 and separate from evil. Any doctrinal system that it comes into existence from man that is maintaining and I think trying to promote the concept and idea that God actually sovereignly and unchangeably decrees, causally determines uh, moral creatures to do morally evil things has to be resisted. Uh, and and I think Dr. Craig does a good job of, of helping us philosophically to push back on that issue. Eric, what would you like to say about that? Um, yeah, so right, absolutely, because he... he when when he was even just talking about uh, uh, the the plausibility, you said that was the last clip. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Then so he he when he brought up plausibility, I, I want to touch on that is because um, he said the standard shouldn't be what's more plausible. Well, a, a few things consider like Craig said, there are multiple interpretations, philosophical interpretations that may be at least consistent. So in other words, that's a bare minimum. And then the next thing would be plausibility. And and what what Craig uses his words carefully, and, and if you don't understand what these words mean in the technical sense, then you can misinterpret it. To say that it's a plausibility is just a humble way of saying I could be wrong. It's just a way of right. saying that we don't have a, a chapter and verse citation proof text that with 100% certainty this is what it means. So um, um, when we look at things, it, Craig's saying that we're justified to a high degree when he talks about plausibility. Um, it's just a humility for not uh, overstating the case. So if we look at something like maximal great being theology, um, that God is the greatest conceivable being that could possibly exist, um, we could we can ask the question, um, does, well, so the open theist would disagree here, but um, it's the first example that came to mind. You know, can God learn? I would say no. So what do we do with these passages? Well, this is going to take a systematic philosophical unpacking. If God is omniscient and knows everything, then he's not learning. We can say it's phenomenological language, whatever. Without going to the discussion, the question becomes this. What's more plausible given the scriptural data to interpret this? When the Bible talks about God's eyes going to and fro on the earth, what's the more plausible explanation? Because you could say on the one hand, it's consistent to say that God has eyeballs. And on the other hand, you could say, well, this is referring to that, you know, he knows all things. Again, without going into the weeds, plausibility is a huge thing because there are 
Yeah. Scripture doesn't give definitions metaphysically of everything. You won't find a correspondence theory of truth in the Bible, but you will find what the Bible teaches is consistent with the correspondence theory of truth. You look at something like, um, I was talking with Matt, Matthew Jackson, I got to meet over the weekend at our an apologetics conference, and he points out how the test of a, of, a, of a prophet or false prophet is a correspondence theory of truth. You know, if 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 this person is a true prophet, this will happen. It corresponds with reality. If it doesn't, that thing is false. So while you won't find a definition of these things, you do need to see what's consistent, at least with the biblical data. And then what is more plausible given the data? And this is going to take philosophy. Well, well said, uh, My Michael Archangel. Um, thank you for your super chat and for your kind words there. I do try to interact uh, with the side chat and to see some of those comments and, and even represent some of our Calvinist interlocutors there on the side. And, uh, and we do appreciate uh, those who tune in and uh, engage with these conversations. That's what makes YouTube uh, different from uh, binging on Netflix in a lot of ways. One, you can learn a lot and talk about things that matter to you versus o o uh, continually hearing uh, all the, the, the garbage that sometimes is out there in the news and all the problems in the world you can come on uh, to a place like this uh, and talk about uh, salvation and sociology and the doctrines of God's grace and his goodness and how this all may work. And you can theology geek out with each other and you can give uh, commentary uh, and engage in the conversation yourself and possibly be uh, even interjected into the conversation. Uh, how far technology has brought us over the years and that can be a force for good or for evil. And I pray that we will use our free will uh, and use God's gift for good uh, and not for evil. God gives us a lot of great gifts, but we're responsible for how he uses his gifts. And he doesn't have to effectually cause us to use his gifts in the way that he wants us to in order for him to get all the credit for the gifts he gives, by the way. And uh, that's why we continue to push uh, on this program about the the love and the goodness and the graciousness of God's provision for every man, woman, boy, and girl. And I appreciate Eric so much coming on the program and helping us to unpack a very deep philosophical uh, and theological um, dynamic that is often debated in our churches and to recognize that though I disagree with men like Brian Wagner, possibly on a point or two, and he disagrees with me on a point or two, that I can love him like a brother uh, as much so as I can love uh, William Lane Craig or my friend here, Eric Hernandez, or even, yes, uh, James White, who disagrees with us very vehemently, obviously, as provisionists, but at the same time, we can show love to our brothers while disagreeing with them in love. And with that, go now, share Christ, and show love. God bless you.